Okay, we're going to start the meeting. I think the director is um, on his way, but we're going to go ahead and, and go ahead and start with the meeting. So we will start with the Pledge of Allegiance. If we could get the flag up on the screen, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. I'd like to welcome everyone here and thank you for coming today. It's a beautiful day out there today. Um, we are going to start with the approval of our minutes from our last meeting. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Are there any corrections or additions to the minutes? All those in favor of approving the minutes uh, signify by saying aye. 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 All aye. opposed, same sign. Motion carries. All right. We'll start with the commissioner reports. Um, commissioner Tabor, would you like to start? Thank you, Madam Chair. Let's see here. Get to my. So probably the most exciting news in region one is we now have a new regional supervisor. Um, Lee Anderson, exceptionally qualified individual. He was the captain of enforcement for gosh, I think close to 20 years, um, his career. And now he's taking over as regional supervisor. And I believe he's probably in the room. You might give a, a wave if you're there. Um, congratulations, Lee. Um, he's taking on a very active region. Um, enforcement has been extraordinarily busy lately, helping uh, with all the river access issues. Um, there's quite a bit of closures that are happening all throughout the region and enforcement is making sure people are paying, playing safe. A um, Couple other highlights. Um, it's uh, pretty remarkable, the number of wildlife conflicts that has been managed by our conflict specialists. So. Um, since May 1st, probably in excess of 300 conflicts that they've responded to, uh, mostly in the black bear and, and brown bear uh, category with a, a, a variety of others, but there's definitely quite a bit of that. Um, they did successfully get all their surveys done. Um, they weren't able to do all the surveys in the way they wanted to due to some pretty nasty weather, but they did get some counts, and so they're going to be publishing uh, what the results of those uh, aerial surveys on the different species. Um, and then lastly, one of the things that I think this region does exceptionally well is their educational program. Uh, shout out to Dylan Tavish, who's uh, in charge of uh, communications there. Um, they have this hooked on fishing program and they just wrapped it up at the uh, Pine Grove Pond. Um, They've had over 2,000 fourth grade students from 60 classes participate in this program, which is pretty cool. The other element about it, which is uh, um, really neat, is uh, tragically, there's a family that lost their daughter to uh, drunk driving. They now hold a memorial every year in conjunction with Fish, Wildlife, and Parks and the Flathead Wildlife Group. And uh, 600 people showed up for this event, and they were handing out uh, little fishing rods to kids. And the reason this uh, stands out in my mind is I brought my four-year-old grandson who, who got himself a fishing rod and it's still proudly displayed in his bedroom right next to him when he goes to sleep. And so uh, really neat program and great, great efforts by the people in the region to do that reach out. So welcome aboard, Lee, and thanks for all the hard work in Region 1. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Waller is with us via Zoom today. So Commissioner Waller, would you like to do a report? Yes, absolutely. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Um, multiple meetings across Region 2 since our last commissioner meeting. Um, I met with a group of the fly fishing commercial users in March when they had their big rendezvous in Missoula. And that was great just to meet a bunch of them in person and to discuss a little bit what uh, their thoughts on some of the progress of the Madison River work group. Um, I attended a June CAC Region 2 meeting where we talked about the Hood Owl 
recommendations, went over some things regarding the rivers, um, elk surveys. We discussed some of the elk surveys and, um, and that scoping would start this summer for the new elk management plan. Um, we also, I also discussed after the meeting with the chair, Everett, um, about how to maybe formalize a little bit better the communication between the CACs and the commissioners. And uh, I think we're definitely onto something there. I also met with Randy Arnold and Liz Bradley, as well as Pat uh, Saffel, uh, discussed specifics regarding the line quotas in region two. That's definitely a big issue for us. Um, we also went over a lot of the history of the harvests um, and where they where they have been the past decade, which has a lot to do with quota setting. And so uh, that was really eye-opening in a great meeting. I feel like they're really on top of it there with region two. Um, we do have a couple of units that um, definitely need uh, more attention to predator management, but they're on top of it. Um, yesterday I spoke with Pat just to get a quick update about our rivers and um, everything in region two is actually looking really good. There were two closures of fishing access sites, but those have reopened. Um, flow is actually below flood stage. Um, it's bouncing around a bit, of course, because of the rains and the temperatures, but um, should be looking to have a good flow this summer. Um, he did want to remind everyone of the safety issues right now with the rivers across the state where, you know, maybe warm and beautiful out, but that river temperature can be dangerously cold as well as um, have some variables, you know, uh, you know, wood underneath, uh, some hazards that he, he just really wanted the public to be reminded about. Um, and the last thing I wanted to say is um, I was I was really impressed with the evaluation report for the 454 agreements. Um, and I would like to encourage everybody to go online and read that evaluation report. Um, it's on, I believe, the FWP website. But, um, you know, I was really impressed with with Obviously, the bill was created back in 2001. It's been around a long time, but not really utilized until last year. And of the 13 um, landowners who were a part of it, you know, 10 out of that 13 have provided additional access. And there's a lot of really interesting statistics in that report. And it, I'm glad to see um, it moving forward. I know the PLPW is talking about the 454s and uh, um, you know how we can make that program better. But there's some pretty interesting stats in there. Um, of the six out of the 13 provided either sex elk hunting opportunities. And there were, of, of the landowners that, that were involved in the program, uh, more than 660 additional public land hunting opportunities came out of that. So I think that's uh, great to see. I think there's some improvements that could be made, but um, I think it's really interesting for the public to take a look at that. That's it. Okay, thank you. And I just want to remind you, if, if you want to comment on something, just go ahead and speak up. Don't raise your hand because I'll probably miss it. So. Okay, we'll do. Thanks. <laughs> right, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Siebel. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's been a, a really busy couple months in Region 5 and probably most important, uh, well, we'll talk more about the flooding and stuff and the impacts. It's in pretty incredible impacts in Region 5. But a um, ton of work being done by the staff. Uh, probably one of the most important things that Commissioner Waller just mentioned is the fact that the uh, the elk plan is, is underway and the public scoping part of the elk plan is underway. There's meetings scheduled in Columbus, Billings, Bing Tibber, Harlowtown, and Roundup the last two weeks of June. So some of those have happened already this week. Billings is scheduled tonight. So I certainly would encourage all my Region 5 uh, constituents that, that are interested in elk and have anything to say to attend these meetings because this obviously is a really important part of this process. Already, uh, the wildlife is already uh, colored a grizzly bear in, in Red Lodge. Um, and probably one of the biggest projects that we've been working on in Region 5 is the big snowy mountain wildlife management area. And that'll come up, I believe, in our August commission meeting or later. I think that's when we actually get to consider that here. I did have the for good fortune to spend a half a day with Ashley, the biologist there, and uh, got, got a uh, behind-the-scenes tour of the wildlife management area and saw elk and turkeys. And, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a really fantastic property. So I look forward to that discussion in front of the commission about that uh, about that wildlife management area. So great, great tour, actually did a great job. Uh, fisheries wise, uh, annual sampling is, is has been, spring sampling has been wrapped up. Uh, Lake Elmo, which is an important part of region five and Billings has been refilled after the big restoration project and they've uh, stocked a lot of different kinds of fish, catfish, cutthroat, rainbows. So exciting, uh, should be good for, for Billings and recreation. And probably the biggest story that I left for last for Region 5 is, is really the, the Region 5 flooding. We've had an incredible amount of rain. I'm sure everyone saw that we had uh, a number of closures, and, and including entire river closures. Yellowstone, Stillwater Rivers, 
portion of the West, West Rosebud and Rosebud uh, Creeks, and along with 12 fishing access sites were closed to due to just massive flooding in that area. We had power lines, we had exposed gas lines, there were houses, bridges, everything in the river. So uh, the, the department and enforcement has been extremely busy dealing with that. And I've got some statistics that I think are really interesting for Region 5 that um, of, of in Region 5, 38 fishing access sites, uh, which is actually about 90% of them, uh, or excuse me, 38 sites were exposed to floodwaters in Region 5. 90% of those were, were restricted at some point in time and still, some are still are. 60% of the fishing access sites that were, were affected by the flooding still need repairs, debris removal, latrines uh, being pumped out, road repairs, uh, picnic tables. 34% are going to need weeks and weeks to clean up. And, and 5%, and this is kind of interesting, 5% will not look like they did before just because the rivers and the channels have changed so much. There's got to be road rebuilding and, and all kinds of work to be done to, to connect portions of the sites again. So uh, flooding is a big story. Hopefully it's decided. There's still a lot of snow in the mountains in our, in our part. And I know there's in, in other parts of states as well, but uh, you know, the, the, the flooding is a big part. It's going to affect the fisheries and certainly fishing access sites for some time to come. So hopefully, uh, and the department's uh, region five has done a great job and it's continuously, it's continuing to improve and, and uh, reopen those sites and get those back up to what people expect. So um, thank you, Manager. Thank you. Mr. Walsh. There we go. Good morning. Um, since our last uh, commission meeting, we've had two more meetings of the Madison River Work Group and several meetings of our subcommittees. Tremendous amount of uh, volunteer work went into the recommendations and proposed rule changes before us this morning. And I'm happy to see we've got a total of five members of the work group here this morning and FWP uh, staffer, uh, Charlie Sperry, who attended our meetings and, and also uh, Dustin Temple's been great with his time attending, I think our last three meetings. Um, I've received lots, I think as all the commissioners, lots of recent email feedback uh, from interested parties, both in the state and out of state on wolf hunting regs and possible quota re reductions. Um, as I understand it, we'll see the proposed changes uh, tomorrow and then be taking that up in August. Um, from Region uh, 4, Warden Sergeant Kyle Anderson from Lewistown received the Excellent Service Award from Governor Gianforte on June 7th for his outstanding public service in the community and FWP law enforcement. So congratulations, Kyle. Drought conditions across Region 4 have improved with the wet, cool spring, lots of moisture still in our high country. Um, which will help later this summer with, uh, with irrigation and stream flows for our fisheries. Flooding has really not been an issue in Region 4 as it has been elsewhere in the state. Uh, the Smith River float season has improved as we've moved into to June with the added rainfall and uh, regional office reports that Smith River's proposed human waste pack out system is being considered and an EA is being drafted for public review. Grizzly bear conflicts have been low relative to historic, but uh, sporadic, uh, still sporadic across the Rocky Mountain front and prairie. Uh, bear sightings in the mo moccasins and nearby areas have been confirmed to be grizzlies. Uh, bear wear education in many communities in region four has been ongoing and uh, we're trying to inform the public about bears and bear safety. Fish regulation changes will be considered for region four or minimal. Most are just cleanup items. Um, field season is now in full swing for the fish wildlife biologists and our wildlife crews, and they're out finishing up uh, our population surveys. I, I understand we just have antelope uh, left on the big game, big game surveys, and uh, the fish field crews are out on the rivers and lakes doing their surveys and also helping with our hatchery crews on uh, clipping fins for research projects. I wanna end on a positive note, the avian influenza is not as prevalent as earlier with reported birds found and uh, reports have dropped substantially. And uh, finally, I'll just echo uh, Commissioner Waller's comments about the 454 permits. Um, it's great to hear uh, so many positive things in region four from our constituents and and uh, also about the late season cow elk hunt in the uh, local area. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Byer. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. As in every other region, it's been a wild spring since we last met. Uh, I'd like to open by congratulating my sister, Susan Fox, who just retired from legislative services and she has been helping coordinate this building for us. Uh, so off she goes into her next adventures. Uh, I'd like to memorialize a friend of mine, uh, Senator Mark Sweeney, who passed away uh, since we met. He was uh, running for Congress at the time, uh, but he's, uh, I remember him mostly as a, as a fish biologist and a friend that worked for FWP around the Anaconda Hatchery. And from Jessica's dad's testimony, uh, he did a great job. And uh, the spawn grayling helped us get our grayling brood and restore Westlow cutthroat trout broods. Uh, he was a great man. He served as a county commissioner. He served as a um, senator and a, and a representative. He was an avid conservationist and did a lot of great work for our wildlife. So I just wanted to remember Mark. Uh, congratulations, law enforcement had a, what I considered a significant arrest and conviction of a of wildlife trafficker down in Beaverhead County. And also the AI, AIS team who uh, I understood uh, conducted over 2000 inspections over Memorial Day weekend and, and found 14 different boats that were carrying uh, zebra mussels. So thank you both enforcement and AIS folks. Uh, like uh, the other region uh, and commissioner's reports, our field staff wrapped up uh, both uh, electrofishing work and also their wildlife flights. And if you think about the, the way the weather was this spring, it's pretty impressive how far they got. And, and I, I've really appreciated getting the reports uh, incrementally over the, over the months. I uh, attended the Region 3 CAC meeting. Uh, it was a great presentation on the upcoming efforts to update the state fisheries management plan. And in particular, the biologists on the Big Hole and Beaverhead presented a, uh, an impressive approach to regulating uh, both those rivers uh, based on biology. And, and it should make this, uh, the commissioner's uh, decisions on regulations down there much easier because it will be based strictly on, on the health of the population and uh, clear response plans. Uh, the CAC members expressed some concerns in their uh, round table. Uh, in particular, uh, there's a lot of concern that the WMA's fishing access sites, and I guess 454 agreements that were be being shifted over into the or parks and outdoor recreation division. And so the members of the CAC uh, have some concerns and I think they might be addressed maybe at the next CAC meeting of how uh, anglers and hunters will still have a voice in the new division. It's, it's a quite a drastic change to change the names of fishing access sites to water access sites. It seems like uh, to them, the anglers and hunters of the, of the state are being marginalized. Uh, as Commissioner Walsh said, we've had a lot of conversations over the wolf regulations and it'll, uh, you know, of course that'll play out over the next few days when the when the proposal comes out and we'll look forward to getting through that uh, issue come August. Uh, I won't belabor the Madison work group other than they, this group has come together, taken a lot of the historic options, looked at a whole new set of options, done their research, talked to professionals around the country. And I just want to congratulate the work group members for the product that you've developed. It's, it's a very impressive set of recommendations uh, over a fairly short time. So kudos, thank you, sirs. And thanks, Commissioner Walsh, for your leadership on that. And finally, uh, we've heard a lot about the flooding. Uh, like Region 5, the Yellowstone has taken out uh, a number of fishing access sites. Uh, and I have been impressed at how, how hard the department is working to get those reopened, to get them back when the water comes down. Uh, the flooding has disadvantaged a lot of, not just uh, the average angler and sportsman for sure, uh, but also will affect um, all sorts of industry in Park County and Region 5, uh, Region 3 and 5, and all the way down to the Stillwater. So I hope that the commission can find ways to provide some relief to um, all the folks that depend on the river for their living. It's gonna be costly to everybody from hotel owners uh, 
restaurateurs, bar owners, and uh, gas stations when the tourists can't get through. Uh, it's easy to for me to enjoy maybe some more peace and quiet on the highways, but it's really devastating to communities. So I hope we can find ways. One idea that has been fronted is to perhaps lift the uh, permanent hoot owl on the Madison so long as the conditions allow, which would allow some, some of those folks that have been displaced maybe from outfitting on the, um, outfitting on the Yellowstone to uh, enjoy a longer season on the lower Madison. I guess I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Lane. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we've had a lot of beneficial precipitation this time in Region 7, which has allowed for some great grass cover. Uh, we're seeing a lot of twins and, and triplets actually in, a, in the antelope. So we're, we're looking very optimistically for the year for the populations to increase. And the same is happening with the mule deer as well. Maybe not the triplets and all that, but we are seeing good fawning so far. It's just, it's not quite over yet, but uh, the uh, antelope are. Um, on another note, probably the biggest thing happening in region seven is the paddle fish. With the new installation of the bypass at intake, there's been quite, more of a dispersion of where the paddlefish are being caught and all the way even up, way up into the Powder River. They've seen actually some up by the Powderville Bridge. So we're seeing a lot more dispersion there and in visiting with Mike Backus, who has done a great job of keeping me updated on a weekly and even daily basis, he doesn't believe we're gonna reach our quota this year just because it has been more of a even keeled take and uh but he says things are looking good he says the the amount of fish that are moving and spawning is just tremendous so a lot of good things happening there and then uh obviously with all of the flooding we just finally got the surge this last weekend and we did, did not see the the damage and destruction that you have been seeing in the other regions. However, we do have a lot of them closed down temporarily due to being able to clean up and just make sure that they're safe for the public to use again. Fishing's not that good right now anyhow. <laughs> so, but uh, no, I just wanna thank everybody in region seven for all that they do and, and look forward to working with them more. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Uh, region six, uh... Currently a pretty diverse region. I know we do have some flooding in the por on portions of our region, but the paddlefish numbers are low because of the low waters in other parts of the region. Um, go from flooding to still, I, I know our reservoirs are still very, very low. So um, we're just a big state and a very diverse state. Uh, the spring mule deer surveys indicate that there's a 23% decrease from last year, but 31% above the long-term average. There was 47 fawns per 100 adults counted, which is slightly below the average of 53. The city of Haver has been working on their final stages of a urban deer plan and the FWP region six went and had a town hall meeting with the, the local people in Haver, not just a few weeks ago. Uh, we have two new fishery technicians one in Haver and one in Fort Peck, Dawson Schott and Jordan Fry. Um, walleye fry stocking has been completed by the Fort Peck and Mile City fish hatcheries. Approximately 30 million were released into the Fort Peck Reservoir. Uh, we, Region 6 has hired Katie Iverson as the new access manager and lots of block management contracts are being signed and it should be another great year for access and block management for Region 6. Pallet agreements are also being approved and are being sent to the landowners for signatures. Uh, we are fully staffed in the recent hire of Ziggy Chamberlain as a maintenance person in Glasgow and Pat Callahan in the Haver area. Uh, says Rock Creek low water boat ramp has been busy this season and 
the, um, they're planning to add some gravel to improve the area. One thing that the Region 6 has been doing is called the Summer Scramble, where the regional administrative uh, employees go to different regions for a few days to assist the other offices, which is building relationships between the offices and, and a little more uh, consistency is how everything is done. So that's I think that's great. And it's always great to have consistency across the, the regions. Uh, I think that about wraps up my Region 6 report. And uh, Director, would you like to give your report? Yes, ma'am. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I really want to, first of all, thank all the commissioners. Um, sitting here listening to your reports, it's, it's very evident that you spent a lot of time, you talk to the regions, you give amazing reports on this. Um, you've got the details from them that shows that you've got a, a solid working relationship with it. And in my tenure with the department, I think this is the best reports I've seen come out of a commission when they talk. So I think it's helped by having seven commissioners, one for each region, and uh, and your willingness to work with the regions and get the details. So I really appreciate that. It makes my report pretty simple because you cover everything. So uh, I, I do appreciate that. and. Uh, want to make sure you get recognition for that. So thank you. Um, I got a report this morning. We had a total of six fatalities in boating this year. Uh, they were all non-motorized and related to either cold or high water conditions. Uh, so that's, and then um, the wolf, you know, talk about the wolf regulations. All that information will be posted tomorrow uh, for all the, for the next meeting. And then people will be able to follow the new process make comments on it. If there's anything that we have to adjust to the wolf regulations or a commission one a commissioner wants to adjust, we have to ask a commissioner to get to make that amendment or a commissioner has to make the amendment on based on what they have. So we're looking forward to that to being more transparent and uh, people understand what's going on with that. Um, one of the things I want to mention is we are going to open the Yellowstone tomorrow. There will be a press release out today. I've talked to several people and a lot of people about it. They're well aware, you know, we've got high water, but this is different because everybody mentioned we've got ridges in there, we've got houses in there. I've talked to one, a couple of different rafters that talked about a really nice rapid they have, but on the other end of it is a whole bunch of cement with rebar sticking out. So what they want to do is, is basically take some runs and identify it and use their, their community to identify a lot of these hazards and stuff and let people know. So um, I think that that will be good to get them back on the river again. Um, trying to think that that CAC, I I, I do need uh, for Commissioner Bayard. I do want to go to the next CAC meeting and see what they're talking about on that. So I'll make sure I attend that and I explain kind of explain the rationale behind this this consolidation and what the wildlife management areas are. It's not that we're changing their use or anything else. We're just trying to maintain them in a better way. And, and use a better use of our of our staff, and uh, kind of this has showed with with the the flooding. We had everybody kind of come together on this, and I think everybody's seen it in the region. We had, I even had fish biologists. My understanding is building uh, sawhorses to put up because we didn't have places to close close the, the fishing access sites. So they were building things to help, and everybody pulled together on this. And it's, uh, I've been very impressed with the teamwork throughout the regions and. Uh, working with the regional supervisor and, and everybody's worked together really hard uh, to, to come up with a solution and get things open as soon as we can. So um, I think with that, that's about all I had. All right. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right. I guess so we will go straight into it. Okay. I think our first, our first item on the agenda will be um, Ms. Stockwell, are you in here or who's going to do the, yep, go ahead. <laughs> couldn't see you behind the podium. We'll start with the 2022 elk hunting access agreements. Good morning, Madam Chair and members. Hope Stockwell, Administrator of the Parks and Outdoor Recreation Division at Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks and representing this morning the department's efforts on the 2022 elk hunting access agreements. In your packet, you have the cover sheet um, talking about the new process uh, that we implemented, as well as the 2021 Elk Hunting Access Agreement Program Evaluation Report. Thank you, Commissioner Waller, for mentioning that. 
Um, there are plenty of kudos to go around with this year's effort. Um, so several people to thank, and I'd like to do that first off. Um, Amber Fettis in the Wildlife Division and Jason Cool in Parks and Outdoor Recreation did the survey work with landowners and hunters um, and compiled the data. And Jason wrote this report off of that and uh, did an excellent job in providing that summary. So I want to recognize that work as well. Uh, we had a cooperative effort with the Licensing Bureau, uh, Devin Boone, particularly in the Licensing Bureau, and then Jason Cool following up on all the applications that came in and making sure that they were complete and all the details were in. Uh, that we needed to process them. They were sent out to the regions, uh, both the access managers in the regions and then the wildlife managers for assessment of the applications and comments. And so um, it's just been a, a real team effort in making sure that uh, we have all the bases covered and, and everybody on the same page. What you see um, are a few different ways to review the information that came in for applications. We have the master list that was posted online, uh, which is a comprehensive summary of each of the applications. We have, um, got to double check my number, 37 in all. Um, and so in addition to the master list summarizing each of those, uh, linked in the master list to each of the applicants' names, you can click on a link and find the original application materials, the map of the property that would be enrolled, and then also the draft agreement to reflect the application as it would be moving forward um, if the commission approves it, um, them for consideration. Uh, a couple of details to provide. We only have one district in which a drawing would be required. You'll recall this year that in districts with there's a limited quota permit, um, landowners under this program would receive up to 10% of, of um, uh, an equivalent permit for this program. So 690 is the district in which we see that occur. We have um, in 690, five archery permits and five rifle permits available under this program with that 10%. And in the applications, we have 10 applicants for a rifle license that uh, 6920. And so, and four for archery. So anyone who applied for the archery permit would be eligible and not have to go to a draw, but the rifle, uh, the general season for 6920 would need to go to a draw. Um, and so Madam Chair, I'll just uh, stand by and leave it open for questions and any additional clarification you might need. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions or comments from the commission? Commissioner Byer, I'll start. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Ms. Stockwell. I had a couple questions. The, the first being, I noticed on the list there was a, at least one 454 agreement that overlapped into BLM or uh, block management area. Would you explain how the, the two remain separate and how the two agreements work together? Certainly, Madam Chair and members, uh, Commissioner Byorth. Uh, there is nothing in either program that prohibits a landowner from participating in both. And so we have proceeded as such. Uh, and so the, a landowner could have their uh, normal block management agreement contract and then also apply to this for the uh, license and permit um, that they're eligible for. And so in many of those cases, the um, I'm sorry, I don't have the total number. I can think of at least three that are also enrolled in block management. Jason Cool. Uh, who is on the Zoom today, I believe, um, could uh, probably give you a more definitive number. But the um, um, in many of those cases, they're using the hunters through the block management program to satisfy the public hunter requirement um, for that one to three, uh, pardon me, the one of the three ratio, those two public hunters are coming from their block management users. And then we're collecting the survey data from the block management use and harvest for the report. Go ahead. Uh, just, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Ms. Stockwell, one of my concerns and the concerns that I've heard a lot from uh, Montana hunters is that the, these elk hunting access agreements will displace block management. So that's encouraging that some are doing both. Are there others that were formerly in the elk or in the block management program that have now shifted over to the elk hunting access agreements? Madam Chair and Commissioner Byorth, none that I'm aware of, but I would defer to Jason Cool if he has any awareness of that. Go ahead. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, 
Madam Chair, Jason Cool with Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. I work with our hunter, our hunter access programs. Uh, Commissioner Byer, Madam Chair, Commissioner Byer, no, we don't have anybody who previously would have been in block management and now is only in the elk hunting access program. Um, as noted, we do have some that are participating in both. Commissioner Siebel. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a, a few comments. First of all, I'd like to thank Hope and Jason and, and the rest of your staff for putting together the evaluation. I, I, I know we talked about it, I requested that last year when we approved these, and uh, I think this was an excellent job and it's exactly what we were looking for and exactly what we need to continue to evaluate the quality of this program. I will say too that, you know, having started with, I think we had two applicants uh, early last year and then added more and then to be up to 37 different landowners now, I think it's an, an, an incredible success in the, from the standpoint of doing something that's an incentive to landowners to open up their land. And I think that the fact that we went from two to 37 in, in a year is, is, is testimony to that fact. And, you know, this, this program has started or was recommended, I think, uh, under the PLPW was quiet for many years. And uh, I see this as really just showing the awesome potential of what happens when you incentivize landowners in, in, instead of trying to intimidate them. So I think, I think it's a great success. And I guess I, I just want to make a couple of comments. One is looking through the evaluations. Uh, you know, I would say that we have to, we have to stay on that as a commission. We also have to make sure that landowners that are participating are doing it in good faith and good spirit. So if we see landowners who are abusing the program and, and not calling hunters back or letting them out for short periods of time, there wasn't too many of these, but uh, there's something I definitely want to keep an eye on. And I think the commission should be able to you know, consider whether certain landowners get the, the, get the permits or not, if they're, if they're not following the spirit of the, of the rules. The other thing that I would say uh, in general is that I would like to see, uh, the, as I understand the criteria for how we, so these people just, as long as they completed the application properly, had the right ratios, I, as I understood, they were accepted into this program. Is that correct, Hope? Madam Chair and Commissioner Siebel, if they completed an application and it, it had everything that we needed, then yes, it's moved forward. Okay, thank you. And as, as a follow-up to that, what I'd like to see considered in the future, we didn't have it in the criteria this year, is some actual is some actual standards that we have for landowners, including in my mind, like a like kind permit. If you apply for an either sex, and you should you, you, it should be a requirement in my mind that at least one of your three hunters has to be allowed the same access. Again, didn't see that too many times, but there was. You know, I think in order for this program to be a success for the public, we have to make sure that that you know we have that kind of that that fairness and participation in the program. So I think something like that should be considered. So I want to just get that on the record. I don't know what we do procedurally from the commission standpoint to get that under consideration for next year. But I would, uh, I, I just want to commend the department and commend Hope and her group that this is an excellent program and we can see how popular it's going to be. And I think this is, this is going to be impactful for, for access in the future. Uh, Madam Chair, Commissioner Siebel. So PLPW is working on that. Um, they're looking at what's happening and the changes that may be made. So those considerations are, are being looked at right now from the PLPW. Anything they can do to adjust it and, and make it uh, a little bit better. Would that have to be a legislative? That uh, will yes. Be, that I mean, that's not commission, right? Yeah. yeah. Thank you for clarification. Go ahead. Would, would you entertain a motion, Madam Chair? Or is it yeah, I just wanted to make one comment. I did oh, see, sure. I, I know last year that uh, we, it, we went farther and we had a deadline this year. So everything's in place earlier. And I saw a couple comments about the hunters that were picked that uh, they um, seem like they didn't get like a timely uh, notification. So this year it shouldn't be a problem. I just wanted to remind to make sure that the hunters are contacted timely yes. and, and fully understood what the program is. Okay. Go ahead, Commissioner Walsh or oh, Commissioner Tabor. I think you've been waiting. That's okay. Um, um, Madam Chair, um, Hope, I see if I did my math really quickly that a total of 47 permits will be um, ultimately um, provided as an opportunity to landowners. How many do the public hunters and what do we, you know, in essence, what is the ratio? Do you have a, a grand total out of those 37 applicants? Um, Madam Chair and Vice Chair Tabor, you know what, I didn't do the math in that regard, but to respond to that. So for each landowner license that's um, awarded or obtained, issued, 
um, you would have three public hunters, one that the landowner chooses and two um, that FWP selects from the lists of randomized. So, um, so it's a one to three ratio, so. So three times 47 is how much public access we're gaining basically. Yeah, and then yeah. Um, Madam Chair and Vice Chair Tabor, we do have landowners that have offered above and beyond that as well. A follow up, Madam Chair. Go ahead. Uh, about how many uh, have offered that up? Because I know that's starting to be a trend where people are going beyond what they're required and actually creating more opportunity. Do you have a sense for how many participants are doing that? Madam Chair and Commissioner Tabor, I don't. Um, we have some folks who are waiting to see the outcome and then that they were going to determine after that. There, there are others that have said, yes, we're going to go ahead and offer additional already. There are some that are just offering what's required, but then there are others kind of in a third category that were waiting to see the outcome of the commission's decision and that they indicated they were thinking about other uh, above and beyond opportunity, but they hadn't made their decisions yet on how they might govern that. Commissioner Walsh. Um, Ms. Stockwell, I want to respond to Commissioner Byorth's question about the block management and possible conflict there and, and just relay that I've got um, one contact, a very large ranch owner in the state, actually in Region 3, who had a very bad experience with the block management program. No fault of the department, it was just bad actors on the hunter side. Um, pulled out of block management. And when I relayed uh, details about the 454 program, they're now very interested in pursuing that for next season. And I just wonder if there, if you could target the um, former block management uh, participants who've pulled out for whatever reason and maybe have addressed the opportunities with 454 with those folks. I think you might find a positive response there. And then uh, I just uh, follow up on Commissioner Tabor's question. Can you please get us the number? Certainly. Yep. We'll do the math. Thanks. Yep. And Jason Cool may have it. <laughs> he's got his uh, Excel in front of him. Knowing Jason, I suspect he's added, used the uh, auto sum and, and figured it out. Uh, good morning, uh, Commissioners. <clears throat> Again, Jason Cool worked with our hunter access programs for FWP. Uh, Madam Chair, Commissioner Walsh, and Commissioner Tabor. Uh, we have about 27 landowners who are going to, at this time, allow additional public access over and beyond the three required by statute. Um, there's a few that we've had discussions with that um, are, are not only interested in the outcome of today's meeting, but then also, um, you know, being uh, ag producers on the landscape, they they have a tough time maybe committing to something that's uh, you know, three, four, five months out yet, uh, they weren't they weren't quite sure how that how their how their summers or how their falls were going to go, and then um, you know, offering public access over and and beyond the minimum required at this time was just something that they were weren't sure about. Okay. I guess I just want, if I remember correctly, next year the deadline will be May fifteenth rather than June first. I thought we extended it. Yeah, so. I just want to make sure that for next year that it's uh, that the landowners are well aware of the earlier um, deadline. But, okay, Commissioner Siebel. Madam Chair, I move that the Fish and Wildlife Commission approve the 2022 elk hunting access applications as presented by the department, and send to a random draw those applications in districts where the peep or where the number of requests for permits and licenses exceeds the department imposed cap of 10 percent of the commission adopted quota previously approved during the biennial season setting process. Second. Okay, thank you. All right, are there any other questions or comments before we go out for public comment? Okay. Is there anyone in attendance who would like to speak to this? Good morning, Madam Chair's members of the commission. Uh, for the record, my name is Marcus Strange, and I'm here representing the Montana Wildlife Federation. Um, I wanted to first say thank you for all your hard work on this. Um, this was kind of uh, a little bit of a, a mess when this program first came to you, and you've done a really great job in getting it punched up and in a, a working fashion. Um, you know, moving up the, the application date was one example that came to mind. So thank you for all of your work. Um, a couple of things that my organization wanted to flag as we've looked at where this program is moving, 
Uh, we're concerned that this is moving away from a wildlife management tool. Um, and one example of that is if you look at where it's at on the agenda, it's in the parks and recreation. This is not a recreation program. If you look at it in statute, this is a management tool to help local biologists address overpopulation of elk specifically on these properties. And so uh, moves to the uh, one to three ratio away from the one to four and some of these agreements being at a, a bare minimum are concerning when this is supposed to be a wildlife management tool. So we would just encourage you to think about that as you're approving these, are we getting the best wildlife management application from this program, which is what it's intended for. There's other great PR options if we're looking to develop better relationships with landowners. This isn't the program for that. This is a wildlife management program. Um, and then finally, one question that we had is how many of these agreements are being uh, developed at the local level with the local biologists? Uh, we feel that that's a really important uh, component of this, um, that these are developed to meet the adaptive needs that are present on the ground. And so um, I would just uh, ask that question and circle back and, and say thank you, because I know this is a program that is um, seeing some really good success. We just want to make sure that we're asking the questions that are needed to make sure that it's functioning in the best way possible. So thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to comment? Madam Chair, members of the committee, good morning. My name is Thomas Baumeister. I'm the volunteer vice chair of the Montana chapter of Backcountry Hunters and Anglers. Less than nine months ago, we were all singing the same song, calling for a better process to manage the 454s. Look where we are today. The department listened and stepped up. We now have a solid process in place. We have an application deadline. We have a, manage, we have a way to manage demand and we have accountability, transparency, communication, and public involvement. The director, deserves much credit for championing this process. I believe this sets up well to continue the effort of dialing in the 454s over time to get to a fully integrated landowner program. Of course, we can continue to debate the merits of the 454s, and we should. We still want to see these timed with a general draw and a 10% cap to be part of the quota, not in addition to it. And for the 454s to be used as an effective tool to manage elk. Yet here is what stands out today. Upon your endorsement today, 37 landowners or their designees will find themselves with an elk tag in their pocket. There will be 37 additional opportunities for the public to hunt private land. There will be 37 places FWP can point to, to demonstrate its commitment to actively manage elk on private land. Perhaps most importantly, and above all, these agreements amount to 37 opportunities for landowners, hunters, and biologists to talk to each other in ways they haven't for a long time. Who knows what will come from this? New opportunities, new friendships, and perhaps new ways of working together. We live in a great state. We live in a great state. My time is up. Yep, your time is up. I mean, we live in a great state where we have a right to voice our opinions, debate our differences, and even sue over elk management. Yet I can't help but call out that facilitating communication among diverse stakeholders in the way the 454s have the potential to do is the only proven way to ever getting anything done in the state. And this was what we ought to do more of. Thank you. Thank you. That is a reminder too, we have three minutes uh, time limit for um, comments. So is there anyone else? Or oh, two, sorry, <laughs> I'm adding. Is there anyone else who would like to uh, comment? Okay. Madam Chair, I was wondering if Ms. Stockwell or uh, Jason or the department could address Mr. Strange's questions. Good question about how much 
involvement is there with the local biologists and the, when these applications are put in? Thank you. Yeah. And after that's answered, I'll see if there's anybody online who would like to comment. Okay. Madam Chair and Commissioner Siebel, I was remiss. I heard that comment and I thought, oh, gee, there's a group of folks I forgot to thank. Um, so there was um, active engagement with landowners in the field um, from access staff, biologists, enforcement, talking about these opportunities and whether this program was a fit for a landowner. And I can't accurately represent how all of those conversations started or by whom or by where, um, but there was absolutely involvement at the field level of folks who have those relationships with landowners saying, hey, are you interested in this program? Um, and, and having that local um, negotiation piece and consideration um, absolutely occurred. So I talked previously about how the applications, once they were submitted, were processed. Um, but there was a lot of work outside of that that also went into it and want to recognize. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone online who would like to comment? Madam Chair, there are no hands raised. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments from the commission before we go for a vote? Okay. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Same sign. Okay, motion carries. All right. Um, our next item on the agenda is the Madison River Work Group recommendations. And so Commissioner Walsh, if you wanna start and then I'll turn it over to Mr. Sperry. Great. Um, first, I want to start by thanking the members of the Madison River Work Group, and we now have six members here this morning. Um, all of these folks have committed a tremendous amount of time, driven hundreds of miles to make our meetings, which have all required giving up evenings with their families. And I sincerely appreciate the commitment that I've seen. It's just been a very productive group of people. I also want to thank Charlie Sperry and Eileen Rice, as well as uh, Deputy Director Dustin Temple for their involvement in our meetings. And uh, finally, I, I want to also thank uh, Commissioner Byorth for attending most of our meetings. It's, it's been great to have a fellow commissioner in attendance and someone with a long history on this topic. Um, I believe that the work group has largely completed our charge as set out in ARM 12.11.67.10. Uh, the charges really were to create uh, allocation for commercial use, uh, trips for outfitters, a process to permit, permit new outfitters, number three, rule changes to address all recreational use on the Madison, including the walk weight and rest rotation proposals, and finally, uh, uh, consequences for permit violations. We held a total of nine Madison work group meetings. And then we developed subcommittees back in February to address specific issues and opportunities. And each of those subgroups uh, met several times and in some cases met for uh, over 20 hours total uh, between our work group meetings. Um, the commercial use um, uh, limit was addressed by Dan Larson and his group, uh, non-commercial recreational use by Dan, uh, Brian McGeehan, and his group and uh, opportunities for new outfitters was uh, headed up by Allison Trelor, who's here this morning, and um, review of the fishing access sites, uh, particularly on the Upper Madison, was uh, directed or led by John Sampson. And then uh, development of a new river ambassador program was headed up by Mac Menard, who's here this morning. Um, the outcomes for the group uh, to date have been first the um, uh, action that we took uh, late last year on the, or early this year on the walkway section below Reynolds uh, Bridge access site and rolling back the rest rotation feature of the arm. Number two, the Madison River Work Group has made robust and well-considered recommendations on both commercial use allocations and highlighted uh, entry for for new outfitters, um, which will be summarized in a few minutes by uh, the leader of that group, Dan Larson. Uh, the work group has developed recommendations for more robust data gathering for non-commercial rec use. This is an important first step in developing a recreational use plan for the Madison. 
which will be summarized this morning by Brian McGeehan. We also developed a pilot new ambassador uh, river program, um, which uh, will help with the efficient uh, use of our access sites on the upper Madison. And this has been done in conjunction with the Madison River Foundation and Montana Conservation Corps who are supplying volunteers for the program this summer. It's gonna start this season. And I, will, I also wanna give a big thank you to a non-member of the work group, Dave Cumline, who uh, was a real champion for this effort. And also to, to a staff person with Parks Department, Jay Poppy, who's uh, uh, committed a fair amount of time visiting the access sites with uh, John Sampson and coming up with a plan. Members also worked with the Parks Department to develop plans to initially improve uh, three important access sites. These include the Varney, Ennis, and Lyons Bridge access sites, and, and those plans are well on the way to being uh, implemented for next season, so it'd be summer of 23. And that is my report. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Sperry, would you like to give us some information, please? Good morning. Uh, Chair Robinson, Vice Chair Tabor, and members of the commission, Director Warsak, and Deputy Temple. Uh, Appreciate your time today. I'm Charlie Sperry, the Assistant Administrator for our Parks and Outdoor Recreation Division, speaking on behalf of the department today. And I too want to say thank you to the members of the Madison River Work Group having helped to support their work and providing information to them. I've observed firsthand their, their terrific effort they put into their tasks and know they did a lot of outside the meeting work as well. So thank you to, to all of you for that effort. I'm really honored to be a part of the discussion today. I've been with Fish, Wildlife and Parks for 20 years now, and a good portion of that, that time has been working on river recreation management issues for the agency. And, and over the years, I've, I've come to describe that there are, there are two components to river recreation management discussions. One's the more technical aspect of it, the mechanics of how you go about managing river recreation. It has to do with the legal part of it, the administrative tasks, data collection, et cetera. And that's really the responsibility of FWP along with stewarding the, the biological resources. From my experience, uh, the harder task is the other piece. And that's what I refer to as the social issues, the more value-laden decisions that come before this body or the legislature and that are the ones the, the public is, is most passionate about. And those are hard questions to answer. You know, what is a fair, equitable amount of commercial use, for example, on the, the Madison River? Um, you know, is it time to consider setting acceptable use levels for public use of the Madison River? Those are tough questions to try to answer. For the department, we remain neutral on those questions and, and do our best to provide you the, the information to help then inform your decisions and in the input from the, the work group and other members of the public. So with that role in mind for the agency, when we received a, a copy of the, the Madison River Work Group's recommendations, we set about a staff assessment, a fiscal assessment of sorts to provide to you as you consider your next uh, steps. And as we approached that assessment, we looked at it through two questions. And, and one was just an overarching question of, are these recommendations implementable? And for example, is are there any obvious legal red flags that would prohibit us from implementing any component of the group's recommendations? And then the second part of our analysis is what resources would be needed to implement the recommendations, financial, staffing, technological, et cetera. So those are the two lenses that we looked through. We've had a, a, a good number of staff working on that assessment. You've got an early version of that. And then as well as a more recent version that had some updated fiscal analysis as well. And thank you to our uh, Lena Havron with the agency for helping put that together. As far as our findings, our assessment results, and I'll keep it at, at a very high level and, and then certainly stand by with staff for questions. 
Um, the, the first part of that, the legal question, are there any obvious red flags legally that would prevent the department or the commission from implementing these recommendations? Uh, Chief Attorney Zach Zippel and, and others looking at that did not identify at this point in time any red flags as the recommendations are currently written. I wanna just go on to also add that this is very fluid. We know that this is a moving target. It's in the form of recommendations right now. No rules at this point have been advanced and there's some overarching additional analysis that would likely need to occur from a legal standpoint on down the road. But at this point in looking at the recommendations, staff did not ad identify any, any showstoppers legally. The other piece, the technical analysis piece, is the biological piece. And Eileen Rice and, and her staff, uh, they continue to monitor the Madison River fishery. They have been and will continue to monitor it. And the staff have learned through their biological monitoring it, that at this point in time, one way or the other, we, we can't make a conclusion or don't come to the conclusion that the, the amounts of use on the Madison River are having a bio, a, um, negative biological impact on those fish populations. Having said that, I think, you know, the importance of continuing that biological fisheries population monitor, monitoring will be critical. And if, for example, in the future, there were decisions made that resulted in real concentrated use in one area or temporal concentration of use over a season, that could lead to, you know, additional pressures on the biological resources. Now, whether that is, turns out to be significant or not. I mean, that's the importance of continuing our, our biological monitoring. From a staffing perspective, in essence, this question about what would it take to, to implement these recommendations, and, and this can get pretty detailed, but just in, in general, overall looking in totality at, at the, the whole set of recommendations, commercial, non-commercial piece, um, that we're estimating that we would need an additional five uh, recreation FTE, and mainly in the form of, of river rangers and river technicians. And, and this has to do in part that with the recommendations, it, they do call for the creation of a, an additional permit system, a new permit system for commercial users that would be in addition to the one we administer right now, the special recreation, <clears throat> excuse me, permit, that we do in, in partnership with the Bureau of Land Management. And so having, in essence, two permit systems does equate to a fair amount more administrative work for staff. And as we look at then the, the other piece of it, the, the, um, the transferability piece, and again, the, the emphasis in the recommendations that the transferability be conducted with ease, that it can be fluidly conducted but also that there's a compliance component that too does take staff, additional staff time that we currently don't have. Um, and then the, the, on the non-commercial side of it, there's a heavy emphasis on the data collection. I mean, we recognize too that we, we do have some good information at our disposal and your disposal on the non-commercial use of the river, but certainly would agree, concur with the work group that, that there is more information that we need to collect uh, to inform decision-making, future management decisions. And that too does require staff time. Uh, from the technological part of our assessment, um, again, speaking to the, the commercial use permit system, if there's an expectation that the application process is, is on, available online and digitized, that does require some technological development on our part. And then probably more, even more significant, again, I mentioned previously, the desire that the transferability piece, in other words, the ability for a Madison River permit holder to transfer a client, excuse me, a trip, commercial trip from them to another permit holder on the Madison River, whether it's for a day, a week, a month, or permanently, there's a fair amount that goes into that administratively, but in particular, the recommendations mentioned wanting that to be um, online and in essence real time. And, and that's the business of being able to enter records online as these transactions happen. That's a benefit to both the person transferring, the person on the receiving end, as well as the, 
keeping accurate records. And then lastly, the compliance piece where when rangers are out on the river, checking for compliance and, and ensuring that, that when commercial trips are encountered, encountered that, that those indeed are reflected in the records. So that's another added technological piece that would require some additional software for us to, to purchase or develop. <clears throat> on the overall, the, you know, when you take into account the, all of the aspects I just mentioned with staffing and technology, um, that the, 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 over, the total, you know, the overall amount of anticipated expenditures, and this is recognizing at the front end, there's some, there's some one-offs, some one-time only expenses the first year in terms of software development, et cetera. But our estimate at this point in time is for the first year, and this would be a fiscal year, we would estimate expenditures in the, in the range of $721,000. Subsequent annual expense, expenditures, again, on a fiscal year, we would estimate after that first year that we'd be at somewhere around $332,864 per year. So $721,711 first year, $332,864 thereafter. That's, that concludes my, the staff assessment. Again, we've got folks here, if there's more detailed questions, whether it's pertaining to our assessment, the administrative rulemaking process or timeline, that we can try to answer any questions you have. And again, I'll just close by saying thank you very much to the commission for tackling this good discussion, members of the work group for helping out and the, and the public that I know is very passionate about the Madison River. We all share that part. Thank, thank you. you very much. There are a couple uh, work group members who would like to give a short presentation to us and then, then I'll go for questions. Um, go ahead and introduce yourself. Madam Chair, thank you. I'm Dan Larson, and I was a member of the Madison River Work Group, appointed as a business representative from the Ennis area. And then um, at Commissioner Walsh's um, request or arm twisting, um, mm -hmm. ended up chairing uh, the subgroup for commercial management uh, and the development there. I uh, want to thank you for the opportunity to be here and present the work group's unanimous recommendation uh, for implementing the commercial management caps on the Madison River uh, as developed under your commission arm in 2020 and then modified over the last year. Um, again, I'm a 26 year resident of Montana. I was born and raised and um, hunted and fished in Northeast Iowa, but fortunately found myself here later in my uh, legal and business career and been involved in a lot of different businesses. For the last 19 years, I've been one of the owners and the managing partner for the Madison Valley Ranch, which is a Orvis endorsed fly fishing lodge located just outside of Ennis. Um, we are not outfitters. We work with outfitters. And we work with the business community in Ennis and surrounding areas to um, both support our guests as well as we support them. I've been involved over the last 12 to 15 years, participating actively in scoping sessions, listening sessions, um, citizens advisory committee meetings, um, uh, active attendee in the negotiated rulemaking uh, process that went on and uh, various commission hearings um, and now this activity. And that involvement that I've had is indicative really of the involvement of our other members of the work group, most of who came with a lot of experience and a lot of background to this long history of looking at the Madison River. So I think you'll hopefully appreciate that as we go forward. The group that I chaired, a subgroup, um, there were seven members that included um, outfitters, uh, representatives, uh, Brian McGeehan, John Sampson, Mike Bias, um, Mac Menard on behalf of sort of a fisheries biologist uh, background, but also his MOGA background. Allison Treeler, who's a um, resident angler um, and of Ennis and also was chairing the uh, looking at new opportunities or the ease of entry for um, new outfitters. And then uh, Rich Geckel, who is a uh, citizen uh, resident angler and very active in the Madison River area uh, in Ennis. 
um, we explored lots of different options. And I hope you had a chance to look. You'll see our June 1st statement is the summary of all the specific proposals. But behind that was a March um, statement, uh, March 21 report that was early on in the process of just all the different issues that we explored. Uh, and there's, it's like peeling an onion when you start getting into this. You're taking layers off, trying to get into it. And that's what we did over the course of nine meetings of my subgroup and three different presentations and discussions within the full work group. And there's lots of layers to the onion. Um, and there's more information that we haven't even given you if you ever want to dig in deeper. I don't wanna go through um, necessarily the uh, details of the proposal. I'll be glad to answer any questions on that. Again, the June 1st memo take, takes you through there, but just to give you a little bit of um, background, perhaps that might be helpful. One is we looked at um, the existing cap on the Beaverhead Big Hole, the BH2 concept of what both worked and doesn't work or what are the impediments there and lessons learned uh, that might be applicable. And we can go into more detail there, but there was a number of different issues that come out from that. And that also feeds into the new um, opportunities for entry, looking again at some of the restrictions that that system had and how could we try to have a system that would be more open for uh, new young outfitters to come in, new river uh, service providers. A key part of that is looking at um, the transferability of permits or permit days um, and the river use. And that's where we did do quite a bit of um, background research on uh, limitations to the SRP, which is a joint BLM FWP program. And because of the joint nature of it has federal restrictions on transferability um, matters. So the development of a special Montana river use permit is what we called it. Um, it could be called something else um, as you go forward, uh, would be designed to take advantage of what was passed last legislative session, Senate Bill 275, and now incorporated in Montana code annotated um, for transferability. And that opens up more access among outfitters and new outfitters. Um, and we think also keeps the cost of entry at a very reasonable level. Again, I recommend the economic so analysis. I, I agreed to five minutes for each of you and you it's your time is up, but if you wanna do a closer remark. I'll, I'll be glad to. Yeah. As you can see, there's lots of, of um, information here, lots of complexity, this, a lot of work that was put in by the members of this. If you asked any one of us, if we were the czar of the Madison River, we'd probably have a different specific recommendation of something a little bit different that we would like. But this was a collaborative, cooperative, lengthy, detailed exploration of issues and options, relying upon historical information, scoping sessions. We all got lots of information um, from outside parties contacting us. And you have what we came up with as a uh, unanimous recommendation. Thank you. I want to. I'd want to thank the whole group. I know it is a lot of work, and we do appreciate everything that you put into it. And uh, Mr. McGeehan, would you like to address the commission, please? Uh, commissioners, thank you for the opportunity to share some of our work from the Madison River Work Group. My name is Brian McKeon. Um, and uh, as Dan mentioned, uh, we, we spent some time in our work group deep diving in, in specific areas. And um, I worked with uh, uh, four other members of our work group to explore areas specific to uh, <clears throat> non-commercial users, non-guided users, and a few other areas. Um, and just to sort of frame, you know, why why we're here, um, there has been a long history of concerns uh, related to the resource and and social concerns of the Madison River. Um, those have really um, grown dramatically in the last decade. Um, 
and and will continue to be exacerbated if we don't find some solutions. Uh, to give you an idea, uh, recreation, recreational use in the Madison River has doubled in less than eight years. Um, in a single year between 2019 and 2020, traffic at boat ramps on the upper river increased by 67% in a single season and by 76% in a single season in the lower river. Um, we do see impacts on the fishery. Uh, in 2017, the department estimated that each adult trout's caught uh, about five times per year. Uh, fishing pressures increased 50% since that estimate was conducted. We have extensive um, concerns about future growth. We have population growth. Uh, nearby Bozeman is the fastest growing small city in the United States. Uh, Gallatin County, uh, if we look at conservative growth estimates, uh, we'll double in with, within 30 years and we'll probably have a half million people in the, in the county within uh, 40 years. So we're watching the, the quality of the experience of the Madison uh, erode um, and, and our recommendations are to address that now. Um, it's happening relatively fast. Um, we have invested collectively hundreds of hours in time uh, looking at the multiple rounds of scoping sessions that have been conducted over the last 10 to 15 years, we've analyzed the work of citizens advisory councils in the past of the uh, negotiated rulemaking committee uh, petitions and surveys. Um, our group has also networked with the community. We've met with chambers of commerce and Ennis, uh, local state senators and representatives, outfitting organizations, small businesses, conservation groups, uh, and many others, and taken their comments into consideration. This is the first time that we've ever had such broad support from so many vantage points to advance a river recreation plan on the Madison. We cannot manufacture more rivers in Montana. We need to ensure that we preserve the quality of the experience and the resource that have made the Madison such a treasured resource to Montanans and non-residents alike. These recommendations that we're sharing with you were unanimously approved by all members of our diverse work group. I strongly encourage you to allow these recommendations to move forward to public comment. As Commissioner Tabor indicated yesterday in your work session, these recommendations are big, but they aren't that big. Most river recreation plans are hundreds of pages in length. These recommendations are simple and compact. They are a compromise of concepts borrowed from plans used in many other states where river recreation plans are very common. While no plan is perfect, they're, they are always better than no plan at all. Uh, just a quick summary of some of the uh, other recommendations that you have in front of you. Um, one is a recommendation to set some requirements for the vessels that are used on certain portions of the Madison River specific to the upper river. And that would be a recommendation that vessels um, meet the, the definitions used uh, in Montana, which are built around some form of propulsion. Um, oars, a paddle, uh, a motor. And, and the reason for that is to avoid social conflict. Um, and that reach the river where wade fishing is popular um, and, and many folks are out there float fishing or generally recreating, floating down without any form of propulsion is kind of a recipe for social conflict. So we recommend that um, floating and things like tubes be, be limited to the lower river and, and one reach of the upper river. That is one of the recommendations before you. Um, there is an area of commercial use that wasn't addressed uh, by Dan uh, Larson's uh, work group, and that is um, service providers that provide a, a combined shuttle service with renting watercraft at the boat access sites. Um, there's really just uh, one large company that does that. We work closely with them, Madison River Tubing, and in our recommendation there, they already are permitted, um, but they currently only report their total use in a year. And so there's a recommendation that uh, they change the reporting to, to, to report like we do for guided trips, the number of launches they do per day. Uh, there's also a recommendation that that form of service uh, be limited to a reach on the lower river where it's currently conducted. That is one of the recommendations before you. And finally, we have a, a set of three recommendations um, specific to non-guided users or non-commercial use. Uh, one, as Charlie mentioned, is to um, develop some better day, baseline data specific to watercraft. Uh, watercraft, we feel, is the where the most concern lies. Um, in recent surveys, less than 40% of river users find the number of watercraft that they view on the river as acceptable. Uh, so there's a lot of concern from various 
uh, groups there on, on, on boats and watercraft. So we recommend uh, some better baseline data, uh, individual people counting, camera data, whatever the department recommends um, as a recommendation. Secondly, we recommend um, that river users be required to have a permit daily. Um, these are very, very common in many other states. Um, generally, you go online, click the day you want, download it, say how many people you want in your float party, print it out, and you have it with you on the river. This is important because it also allows us to gather better data on, on floating use. This would be specific to float parties. And in the future, uh, we do recommend a recreation management plan be established. Um, this is the most common tool in many other states for managing um, use on a river. And, and finally, uh, our recommendation is that a comprehensive Madison River Recreation Plan is established um, in the future. We do have uh, about 11 pages of ARM that falls under your jurisdiction as the Fish and Wildlife Commission to address river recreation. Uh, very, very detailed and lots of tools presented there. Uh, we also have, as a state, um, Charlie Spear was actually the co-author, a uh, a guideline, a document on uh, developing that river recreation plan. So, so we encourage um, you to commit to developing a river recreation plan uh, in the near future. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Sperry, would you mind just kind of going through real quickly what, uh, what the timeline uh, would have to be for any arm rule if we uh, put one forward? please. Madam Chair, members of the commission. Yeah, I think the, the document that, that we handed out this morning that was prepared by legal staff, and I'll certainly be looking hard at, at Zach and Jessica for, for details, but the, the, the handout that we shared with you this morning at, from your request yesterday, and I believe you asked, you know, what would be the, the timeline if the commission were to initiate administrative rulemaking today? Um, if that were to happen, the proposal notice would be published on the 8th of July. We would then proceed to a public comment period that would end on August 5th. The commission would be scheduled to make a final decision on August 25th. The adoption notice for the rules would be published on the 23rd of September. And that's when the rules would okay. officially be done. That's, and, yep, thank yeah, you. And thank I know you. I know we have it. I just wanted you to go over it just more yeah. for the public, but could you just quickly uh, explain with the legislature coming up that we are on under a certain um, threshold as to when we have to finish so yes madam chair members of the commission i think i would like to defer if you will to zach zippel um, given that i had the wrong date yesterday <laughs> okay <laughs> thank you thank you Madam Chair, members of the commission, uh, Zach Zipfel, legal counsel for the department. Um, what we're referring to here is a, a 90 day moratorium um, statutorily that was adopted during the last legislative session that prohibits uh, final adoption of any administrative rule. Uh, and I believe that that would, you know, it's that September 30th would be the last day that a, a rule could be adopted. Um, beginning October 1st, no rules can be adopted through the end of the year in a legislative, in, in a year of preceding legislative session. Okay. Thank you. I know there was probably several people listening yesterday, but I just wanted to make sure that everyone was clear. Um, are any questions or comments from the commission before I go out to come? Go ahead, Commissioner Lane. Madam Chair. Oh. Madam Chair, thank you. I just had... Uh, first of all, I want to thank Commissioners Byorth and Walsh for your work and as well as the working group. I know it's a kind of a daunting task and thank you for all your work. Um, I guess I just, I don't know who to direct this question to, but as far as the budgeting, where, what, I guess, what is this state special revenue and where does that come from? 
Madam Chair, um, Commissioner Lane, um, Dustin Temple, Deputy Director for the Department, that special revenue account referred to in the fiscal analysis is going to be general license revenue. And it would come from, as proposed, from existing department authority. Do you have a follow up or is that good? Yeah, that's, I just have a quick follow up sure. as far as, I guess, does that fall within budget? As Ms. far as projected. Madam Chair, Commissioner Lane, um, you know, I think, you know, if, if the commission were to adopt the rule, um, you know, the department's obliged to put it on the ground. So we would make it work. I would say that um, given some of the some of the technology development costs that are potentially outlined, um, it's likely that the department would seek an additional appropriation for that. Madam Chair. Thank you. Further questions? Commissioner Byerth. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, again, I just want to echo uh, the sentiments earlier that uh, we were really proud of the work the work group has done. Uh, if you think about what's been going on in the Madison related to uh, recreational conflict, it goes back a long time. In fact, uh, Commissioner Walsh mentioned Dave Cumlin, who was on a on a Madison conflict committee back in the 70s and early 80s. In um, more recent times, this commission has forestalled moving forward on this issue uh, now three times. The first time uh, was in around, I think it was 2011, uh, when the department had promulgated a proposal to, re to regulate recreational rules. At that time, the, the commission decided uh, it needed more study. There was a negotiated rulemaking committee that was assembled. Many of the members, uh, or at least one of the members participated in both the more recent and the historic efforts. Uh, they, again, the commission developed a set of rules and decided we needed to wait and learn more. And uh, this commission, or the previous commission, then out of the courtesy to this new commission, uh, installed rules that enabled this work group to move forward and let this commission take the leadership necessary to move the issue forward. Uh, this commission pulled back on a few of the rules at the behest of the business community who was engaged in the work group. Uh, in this history, time and again, there's been, we need more information and we need more information. We need more voices at the table. Uh, I'd like you to look back at the history of this and look at the 9,000 public comments that came in. It, it overwhelmed everything at that time, except for wolves, uh, in terms of public participation. We've heard it, we've heard it again and again, and this work group took the reins and did a wonderful job of assembling a lot of information and a lot of knowledge that had been packed together through the department at various work groups. Uh, and I just feel like it's, it's time for this commission to take leadership, and that's for two primary reasons. One is the, the biological reason. And uh, it's very difficult to get a fish biologist to give you anything absolute. Um, and so I understand the fisheries division's comment that uh, you can't tell at this time what this would do for the fishery. But what I do know is uh, the biological data that's been collected over time shows that there's a stress in the older age classes. We have good recruitment now, but we have uh, poor survival in the older and larger fish classes. That's an expression of exploitation. We have a dam that has gone through the ringer this year, right? It, remember it broke back this spring and uh, basically froze out a bunch of reds and the river was at historic low levels. And then we have this crazy weather, dumping snow and rain on snow that we fill up Hebgen, thank, thank God. And, uh, but now we're at uh, experiencing high flows. So this idea that the, everything is fine with the fishery I don't think is quite uh, accurate. I think it's time that this, this commission take uh, initiative and take leadership. If we can pull off the EHA, uh, which we talked about earlier, the department did a very great, good job of establishing a new program, getting it on the ground. We can do it with Madison. It's time to do it. Uh, so for that reason, Madam Chair, I'd like to make a motion that the commission move uh, the proposal forward as described in the proposed armed uh, edits of dated uh, May 31st to rulemaking. 
Is there a second? I would second it. I'd like to hear comments from the other commissioners before we proceed. Commissioner Tabor. Madam Chair and uh, fellow commissioners. So I personally feel that the work done by this committee is outstanding. I mean, and if you take that history, nobody's advanced it to a point where we can now really say, okay, what is it that we're trying to do on this river? If it weren't for the result of your committee and all the hard work that you guys did. So the, so the real question is not, not going forward. We're definitely need to go forward. But I guess the question that I would ask is, what's the right process to apply at this time? If we go into rulemaking like this, it creates a very narrow set of feedback and it moves it out of the jurisdiction of fish and game and puts it really in the domain of the Secretary of State. And so that creates limitations on our ability to really get a robust amount of information from the public. If prior to doing that, and it also, I don't think that there's been adequate time, certainly not for the commission, I think even for the department to assess the appropriateness of the construct of the rules. So it's going straight from committee into rulemaking instead of the normal process, which would say, here are our recommendations. We can take all those recommendations. You've given us some sample language to look at, but let's now scrub that. Maybe we modify the language and everything else and then put a comprehensive rule package out. And so the, the, the issue here is not to delay this. It's not to not let it happen. It's to do it so thoroughly. And here's, here's why from my perspective. This isn't just about the Madison. It is for the folks, obviously, that are there and, and worked on the focus of it. I look at this as, as possibly creating a template for how we're gonna manage every river in Montana. And so because of that, there's a lot bigger, broader importance to the decisions that we're making on this than just the Madison. And the question you know, that I would want the public to ask is, are we okay with knowing that some type of fee limited entry system is coming our way on this river and every other river in Montana? Because that's the question we're really posing here. Are we okay with creating permit systems and commercial caps that create financial benefit to outfitters on every single river in Montana? Because that's the template. Now the public may say, we're absolutely okay with this. And yeah, we're gonna adopt a kind of river management system that Mr. McKeon referred to in other rivers and other states, and we may very well get there. We may have to get there because of how much everybody loves Montana. The question is who all's participated? And I counted it up. We have 28 days to stay in a real strict format with the Secretary of State if we go rulemaking versus a little bit more time to do this right, maybe flush out some of the issues that the committee came right up to with great recommendation, but there may be a few others and then just really finish the job well. And so I'm not in a hurry to do something this monumental. I know you guys are in a hurry from the standpoint of all the time and effort you've put into it and you, and you wanna see something happen. What I can tell you is I think something's gonna happen. The real question is when should it happen and how comprehensive should it be so that we can all look back at it and say, you know what? That was a process done well. And I think you're, very clear on the fact that we've taken as a commission and the department, a lot of criticism about, we don't do this. We don't do that. We don't involve the public. Well, I feel compelled with something this monumental to do it as a public. So I'd like to propose a different um, motion. I would move that the fish in- There's route. a motion on the table. I believe that we're allowed to have multiple motions on the table. And that was determined the last time. Madam Chair, members of the commission, there can be two, two motions on the table at the same time. I'd move that Fish and Wildlife Commission conduct public scoping of the Madison River Work Group's recommendations. I request the department quantify the cost of implementation of the work group for the first year and recurring years after. I also request that the department to provide a legal opinion on the commission's authority to implement each of the work group's recommendations. Is there a second? So we have two motions on the table. Is there any other discussion? Mr. Siebel? Um, Madam Chair, a couple of things. First, I'd also like to echo what the other commissioners have said and thank Commissioner Walsh and Commissioner Byer for their hard work on this. And, and uh, Mr. Larson, Mr. McGinn, and the rest of the members of the Madison Working Group, just a, a phenomenal amount of work and a phenomenal amount of detail. When we first were introduced to this process and you know we're, we're still a relatively young commission last year, 
it didn't, you know, the, the whole idea in the arm that's sitting out there that we postponed doesn't have, I, I would say doesn't have a lot of, uh, it, it's a cap, but it didn't have all the pieces that needed to be in place for this to happen. And I think you guys have, have taken what essentially was, we came this far uh, it, with, with the original cap. Now we're, now we're up here and we've done a lot. We put a lot of details in and those, everyone knows the devil's in the detail. And you guys have done a lot of the work to, to get to those details. I have lots of questions and, and, and lots of specific questions about how this works and how, how it impacts the, uh, how it really impacts the social, uh, you know, the, the, the social overcrowding versus, you know, the, the, the biological impacts, but the, this perception of overcrowding on the river and how these, how these rules are going to be implemented and how they're actually going to impact that. But that, that aside today, uh, you know, I, I would I would support uh, Commissioner Tabor's motion only because I think this is is precedent setting, and uh, and, and I and I believe that this is this is part of the the bigger picture here is is exactly that what's going to happen with this river what's going to happen with all of the rivers we know that you know the the Bighorn River uh, which is in my district and I love to fish is another area that that has uh, much smaller and has a lot of issues with overcrowding on certain days, uh, and so there's lots of other rivers that this is going to be applicable to so. In general, I support the idea, but I do want to I do want to just reassert the, the fact and, and reassure everyone that if we choose, depending on which way we choose to go today, this is not diminishing, this is not discounting, it's not throwing out the work of this work group. It's taking the work of this work group, putting it out most likely for a public scoping process if we choose to go that way, getting more public input and, and potentially coming up with some changes and ideas to make this even more comprehensive package so we can go out to rulemaking with and, and put together one package. And the idea of having it under the authority of, of public or department scoping versus under the Secretary of State process in an arm is, is, is attracted to me. And I think the way that this should go. And I guess I'd like to, uh, Madam Chair, if it's possible to throw, I th think there's another motion that has to be made if we, if we uh, with the existing arm. That's a separate topic at this point. Right, right. but it, but okay. for, I would, I mean, first, can we hear what the motion is? Because if we go out for public comment, um, we can take comment on on all of our discussions. Just the, the the thought process: if we go to public scoping and don't go through the rulemaking process, the original arm motion is, or the original arm that we delayed until implementation January one twenty three that doesn't have a lot of the details in it, is it either needs to be postponed. Something needs to happen. From from my perspective. There's not a lot there, as I said, with that original, with the original cap and the details or what this work group worked on. So uh, my motion, and I can make that motion, would be to, to hold off indefinitely that that cap and that that arm and implement it at the same time that we implement the comprehensive plan after we're through this process. And I have I have some motion language for that. So I guess I have a, a question. Could that would it be cleaner to add it to the other motion? Because depending on which motion is. Um, accepted that seems like it goes with with commissioner Tabor's motion madam chair members of the commission it seems to me that the, the cleaner way to do it is to hold off on commissioner Siebel's motion depending on uh, the discussion and the outcome of the two motions that are currently on the table okay so my next question would be if uh with that motion would we have to go back out for um public comment madam chair i i think again Following up on the cleanest approach to this, I think then a second um, period of public comment, if we get to Commissioner Siebel's motion, would be appropriate. Okay. Thank you. Madam Chair. Commissioner Byers. Uh, because it's already in the arm rule, it's a rulemaking process to change that. Uh, I would highly recommend that we not try and lump a bunch of motions into uh, one. Sure. All right. Any other questions? I guess um, I I also agree that our timeline, because of the legislature upcoming, our timeline is very short. And I I think that uh, I know this has been going on for a very long time, but but what would go out to the public if if uh, Commissioner Tabor's motion is approved is what you guys put together, and we wouldn't have that without your work group, and so. I think it'd be, it's way it's a lot clearer to the public as to what they would be looking at to um, to comment on. So I guess that's that's where I'm leaning. Just and a lot of it is because of our very short timeline to get something through before our deadline. 
Madam Chair, may I? Go ahead. I'd like to correct uh, the timeline a little bit. We cannot adopt a rule between October 1st and December 31st. Right. We can adopt a rule on January 1st or January 5th or January 15th. So we can, uh, the commission and the department, we, we don't have to rush this through in three weeks. But if we initiate rulemaking, we can actually get a rule in place in time so that the business owners and the people that rely on, on uh, our outcomes will actually be able to plan into next year. Otherwise, it's it just continues to hold us in abeyance. So we can move forward with rulemaking. We just cannot adopt it after October 1st. My bigger concern is the time that the public would have to comment on it um, because it would just sit for three months before we could um, actually adopt it. But that doesn't um, give the public any longer to comment based on what we would have to move forward with. Any other questions or comments? Commissioner Siebel? Madam Chair, I think it would be beneficial to uh, hear from the department and for the public the definition, the difference in the definition of department scoping, which we do a lot of and you do a lot of, versus the public comment period that would be underneath an, an arm process through the Secretary of State. I think that would be a good question. What would you foresee as going out for public comment? What would that look like? Madam Chair, members of the commission, when we, when we talk about scoping, um, the way I think of it just sort of intuitively is that that, that is um, a more open-ended process. It, is, it includes information gathering, and it typically would be something that would be done before there was a formal proposal. When we get to formally proposing, and you know, the proposing is an action that, that kicks off that Secretary of State's timeline and the calendar that the Secretary of State operates by for publishing, public comment, and then final adoption, which the end of that has to be within six months of the initial proposal. Uh, when we get to that timeline, we're talking more about public com comment. You've actually put an, uh, you know, a, a formal proposal on the table, and the comment is directed at the substance of that proposal. Does that answer the question? Okay. Commissioner Tabor, did you have a question? Um, I had one question. I'm not sure if it's for Hope or, or who else in the department, but, and perhaps you, uh, Mr. Director. But, uh, so, when the change went about where we now are involving parks and recreation in their board for looking more specifically at allocative measures and everything else, I'm a little confused as to ultimately who is going to be the curator and, and uh, governor of this system. Because if I understood correctly, ultimately a lot of the allocative systems and crowding issues and everything else will be administered by parks and rec, not by fish and game. So you know, our focus, it, it clearly got started here. It got started. The history of it is, but can you help me understand? Cause I'm a little confused as about who will actually really implement this. Is this going to be a more a parks and rec thing later on? Does it move over or do we even know the answer to that at this stage? Madam chair, uh, vice chair Tabor. So the regulatory authority for this remains with the Fish and Wildlife Commission. So it is, it is within the commission's authority, not the Parks and Rec Board's authority to, to do this. Um, you know, we have a number of divisions who routinely transact business between in front of both the commission and the board. So the, the administrative responsibility, the director has assigned to the Parks and Outdoor Recreation Division. So staff in that division will implement whatever this commission decides to do as it uh, relates to regulating um, activity on the Madison. Thank you for that. Commissioner Walsh. I'm um, a little surprised by the quick movement to motions this morning. I um, voted for each one of these recommendations at the river work group level, and I support them strongly. Um, however, um, just so the public knows, we received the uh, budget numbers, the requirement of close to three quarters of a million dollars last night, uh, about 7 p.m. So it's, uh, I think many of us are still digesting that and the timeline. I, I would agree that 28 days is not a lot of time for, um, for something of this magnitude. And I echo Commissioner Byer's comment that this has been going on a long time and it's a, a, a big issue for the state and 
I think Mr. McGeehan did an excellent job of capturing the uh, the issues that we're wrestling with, where you know we've got huge population growth. I heard that uh, one of the boat drift boat manufacturers in the state is now on an eighteen month backlog, so we have a lot of more a lot more drift boats coming uh, to our rivers. Um, and what we're doing here is precedent setting for every major uh, river in the state. Um, I guess my concerns are the budget uh, that we received last night and uh, the comment that I received from Mr. Kujula this morning that there's potentially no way to fund that in, in this cycle. And then I also look at the idea of implementing these uh, system requirements between September 23rd and December 31. And I might just back up a minute and say, I come out of private industry. This is really the first time I've ever been involved with state government. And I am still getting used to a different pace and, and uh, time requirements. But even in our business, I'd consider that a pretty short time frame to implement. Um, I think I might want to revisit the uh, process adjustments that we've made in the past six months um, based on how this is going this morning. Uh, I was concerned about this, that we really, in the, in the midst of our river work group uh, process, we were adjusting to a new um, rulemaking process with the, uh, with the commission. Anyway, I don't support the motion as it stands uh, on the floor right now, but um, I understand it. The commissioner table. The first and second, yeah. So with that, I'll wrap up my comments. Madam Chair, um, I just want to clarify, Commissioner Wall, so you have the, the motion that uh, Commissioner Byorth made and you seconded, and then the one I made and Brian seconded, uh, you don't support either one or you don't support the one that I made? Well, I said when I, um, I didn't second uh, Commissioner Byorth's motion, I said I would second it, but I wanted to hear comments from the other commissioners. I just don't. Uh, okay, I, so I misunderstood that. So it, I, it does not want, have a second? I did not want to abbreviate the dialogue. So you did or did not second it? I, I did not. Okay. Is I'm going to go back to your original motion, Commissioner Byer, to see if there is a second for it then. I misunderstood. So I'll restate my motion. My motion is for the commission to proceed with to rulemaking based on the recommendations uh, listed in the um, proposed arm edits uh, of 531 that was provided to the commission. Okay. So is there a second to that motion? Just a question for Commissioner Byer. Do these timelines concern you? Uh, not at all. I, I think. Uh, we owe it to the local community to provide some certainty and predictability. I believe there's a public comment built in for 28 days and the commission still has the opportunity um, on at the 25th commission meeting to review public comment and to hear what people have said and then choose not to adopt at that point. I think there's a built in public scoping and public comment period and we're not locked in at that point, but it gives us an opportunity to hear from the public in a way that starting from scratch basically is what a scoping process is. Uh, it loses the momentum and all the hard work that has been put into today. So that's my, my rationale. Chair Robinson. Commissioner Walsh. Uh, a question for you. Would the, um, if we proceed today with this uh, motion, Commissioner Byer's motion, and the staff determines that this is not possible by January 23, uh, would we then just vote down the, the motion in our August meeting? I have a bigger question. It, uh, the, we still we have that deadline of the cap going into place on January 1st, 2023. Do we have to go through ARM rules to adjust that date? And if we go through this process, we run out of time to do that. Madam Chair, members of the commission, that is also a formal rulemaking process. So yes, that would have to have a proposal and that would then kick off the Secretary of State's timeline um, that then would result in potentially a final adoption of that, that change. So if that goes into effect, we really need something in place. We can't be delaying uh, 
the other part because something is going to have to go into place unless that is adjusted. Madam Chair, there was a second motion that I guess uh, Commissioner Siebel was going to suggest in that regard, but but the recommendation was not if we had two competing motions on the table. I'm still unclear if we have two competing I, motions. And that's the thing. We still do not have a second for Commissioner Byors. I will second the motion. Okay. okay, so what I see is we're going to have to go up for public comment on these motions, and then for however it shakes out, then we will have to, uh, we may have to adjust uh, and have another motion to um, for the timeline. Yes. Okay. Any other questions or comments before we go out? Go, Commissioner Siebel. Madam Chair, I'd just like to just say, uh, just address something Commissioner Byrath brought up that, you know, in, in, from my perspective, these recommendations, as I said, they're, they're fantastic. There's a lot of detail. There's a lot of really, really good work that went into these. And that's exactly, I, I don't think we're starting from scratch, taking these out in a scoping process to the public. This isn't going out and just saying, you know, here's a problem. What are, you, what are your ideas? Here are specific recommendations that we'd like you to comment on and, and bring, bring your thoughts on these and, and others. But this is a very direct process by the department to get that comment and get public, uh, public participation in it. And that's why I'm supporting the idea of, of scoping. But again, the foundation of the scoping is, is, is starting with these recommendations that were made by the working group. Thank you. Madam Chair. Commissioner Tabor. Um, I just want to respond to the issue of how long it's taken um, because that comes out, out a lot uh, as a reason why at the very end we have to super hurry up and get this done because it's taken us so long to get here. Well, I, I think there's a reason for that. There's a reason why multiple times it's come and it hasn't worked. And it's the reason is it's because it's so complicated and it is precedent setting. And quite honestly, the previous commission made a decision, but put it on us to try to sort it out. And I don't think that's lost on anybody that that was done. And so just because they put a deadline on this commission, this particular commissioner is not interested in being forced into a decision because I want it to be the right decision for Montana and all the rivers, not just the Madison. And I'm okay with just a little bit of a delay, not losing any of the work that this committee and this group's done. We will not let that happen. We have to have scoping go out, but it doesn't make sense to me to jam and cram something that all the previous commissions in the last 12 years couldn't, couldn't finish up. Now the onus is on us to have to do it in 28 days. That, that doesn't make a lot of sense for something that's been so complicated and so long in the making. Let's just finish it right. You guys started off perfect. Let's finish it right. That's my recommendation. Madam Chair. Commissioner Byers. So, uh, I want to understand that you're ready to initiate a rulemaking process to repeal the rule, but not to create a rule. We, we have enough time to rush in and, and lift the cap, but we don't have enough time to create the cap or to implement the cap. Uh, and let's, let's remember that this commission repealed a whole set of rules that the previous commission started. So you went through a rulemaking process to repeal previous rules. So let's at least tell the, the full story. Um, when we're trying to kill something that's been a long time in coming and is uh, an imminent necessity. Any other comments or questions? All right, um, I will start. Oh, oh, Jenna. Yeah, go ahead and speak up. You're, you were on mute, so. Oh, that's okay, um, Madam Chair. Um, I'm feeling a little bit uh, reminiscent of the elk season setting here as we go back and forth. And I just wanted to say that I've talked to a lot of people about who were actually on the working group. Um, thank you to Commissioner Walsh and Byer for attending and being so involved in this. And I think it's pretty complicated. Um, I just wanted to state out from a fiscal uh, point of view that I do think Commissioner Tabert um, and Siebel have lots of really, really good points. Um, in terms of financially, where this um, funding is going to come from, especially if talking about it coming from the general fund. Um, but I just, I, I feel really strongly that I don't want the people who put all these evenings in to come to this um, feeling like they're not being listened to. I do, I, I, I strongly want them to understand, like, as, as Commissioner Siebel said, it's not if, if we do go forward and delaying it 
um, for a short period of time, it is not. Uh, it is. It is not in any way setting it back to square one. I just don't want people to think that we, as a commission, have not um, all read through the documents and what each step means, but maybe needing a little bit more time. I just wanted to echo that. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay. All right. I will go out for public comment. Uh, Reminder, two minutes, and uh, we'll start with the people that are in attendance. Oh, oh, wait, okay. I guess the commission would like a short break. So, all right, let's do, yes, a five minute break.
Okay, we're gonna start again. If everyone could please be seated. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, Madam Chair. Commissioner, uh, go ahead, um, Mr. Temple. Um, Madam Chair, there's just for the commission and the public's benefit, there is one additional time pressure on the rulemaking process on the back end. If, uh, with the chair's indulgence, I'll have Zach explain that as well. Okay, thank you. Madam Chair, members of the commission, um, to follow up on uh, Deputy Director Timble's uh, question. So when we talk about that six month timeline, you know, it, it is not an open-ended timeline. We've got a, a couple competing timelines. The, the six month timeline is from publication to publication. So when, let's say, um, you propose a rule that officially becomes proposed when it is published by the Secretary of State in the next Montana Administrative Register. Uh, I believe, um, just checking our dates here, um, I believe that would be July 8th. Am I reading that right? Uh, so that would be the publication would be July 8th. We then have six months to finalize that um, from that date, not from today's date. And so that would put us out into January 8th. Approximately, yes. Madam Chair, question for that. So, so if we didn't get it done in time, then the whole package comes back off? Madam Chair, members of the commission, that's correct. Yeah, so, okay. And hey, I do have one more question. Um, so when we take public comment, we'll take public comment on both motions, but I will take a vote on Commissioner Byars, uh motion first but the thing if it if if that fails and the other one passes we do need the we do need the other portion of it to for the deadline for the cap to be implemented so i guess i'm going to ask you again it, to me it makes sense to have that other motion that commissioner siebel suggested because it'll all be well we would still it seems one would if one passes, the other one is moot. And so that's my question. Madam Chair, members of the commission, that's certainly at your pleasure. I'm, I'm a little bit of a linear thinker. I, I like to see things lined up. And so as we had this discussion back and forth, it seemed to me the easier way to do that uh, would be to, to, to separate them. If that's how you want to approach it, there's nothing wrong with that. I think the only thing that um, I would advise everyone to do is to be clear about what it is you're referring to. So that when we have to go back and look at that, reg that, that record of the dialogue, there's not any confusion about what is actually taking place. Okay. Madam Chair, can we ask yes, Mr. Zippel a question? So I, I need to understand why would we, why is it ne necessary that we repeal the cap going into effect in 2023 in order if 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 the motion to move forward to rulemaking fails why is it necessary to not implement the cap in 2013 the cap can, the cap is the cap madam chair commissioner byerth i'm going to look um at some of the the draft motion language that we we created um to try and answer your question um, I believe as, as a couple of the, there, there would be a couple options. I believe that, that Commissioner Tabor, or maybe it was Commissioner Siebel, I apologize, um, was, was making a specific motion with respect to that cap. Uh, there are other motions that conceivably could be put forth with respect to that cap, though. Chair Robinson. Commissioner Walsh. I, I made this comment last night. I think without the um, adopting the proposals that we put before you, and we just move forward with the cap that came out of the, the last arm, that then there would be no, um, we, we need that river use permit to create transferability between the outfitters. And without that, I think the outfitters on the medicine would have a real mess on their hands for the season. But that, I guess that's how I perceive it too. It's kind of a, a package deal. 
Commissioner Siebel. Madam Chair, that's exactly the reason that I brought up that that motion is in, in from my perspective, it's it's chaos uh, to put the cap in without without the details that uh, things like this working group have put together. So it would be my suggestion that we include that if uh, and I don't you know, again procedurally, I don't know if it's a third motion if that confuses things. If you want to go out for public Commissioner comment, Tabor, would you be agreeable to amending your motion? I'd like to hear his motion first, but yes. Um, Madam Chair, what I would move is that we amend uh, Commissioner Tabor's motion and add, uh, in addition to it, that we move the fish that I move the Fish and Wildlife Commission to initiate rulemaking on Arm 1211-6705 to amend 12, Arm 1211-6705, Subsection Three, to be implemented upon adoption of an allocation method or a comprehensive river plan and rule package. Okay, is that acceptable? Yes, it is. Okay. Okay, and you have the second, so you accept the amended. Okay, what I would like is uh, Commissioner Byarth, if you would please read your motion. Before we go out for public comment, I'd like the motions read again, please. Madam Commissioner, uh, Madam Chair, I my motion was to move the commission to advance the Madison River work group recommendations to rulemaking as described in the ARM recommendation summarized in the May 31st, 22 document. Okay, thank you. And Commissioner Tabor. Um, my motion was um, to move the Fish and Wildlife Commission conduct public scoping of the Madison River Group's recommendations. I request the department quantify the cost of implementation of the work group for the first year and reoccurring years after. I also request the department to provide a legal opinion on the commission's authority to implement each of the work group's recommendations. Additionally, I move that the Fish and Wildlife Commission initiate rulemaking on ARM 1211-6705 to amend it, 11-6705, specifically subsection three, to be implemented upon adoption of an allocation method or a comprehensive river plan and rule package. Okay, thank you. So these are the motions that we are going out for public comment. I will open it up for anyone who's um, in person for commenting first. Just remember there's a two minute time limit. Commissioners, Madam Chair, my name is Mike Bias. I'm the Executive Director of the Fishing Outfitters Association, Montana. I'm here today to urge you to not delay ex um, any existing rules, but implement the best of 19 or 20, starting in January 1st, 2023. Also, we fully support the initiation of rulemaking um, put forth by the unanimous, unanimous recommendations of the work group, the Madison work group, and put that out for public comment and start that process now. Um, we've been officially part of the Madison issue since uh, being on the CAC in 2011 and 2012. I've been a member of the Madison Negotiated Rulemaking Committee in 2018. BOEM has filed a petition for uh, Madison River Management Plan in 2019 and again in 2020. Um, in our 2020 peti petition, uh, we urged the commission to manage the total trips based on 19 and 20 with great concern that increasing use on the Madison can potentially harm the, in, uh, the resource. With regard to scoping, in April of 2018, when the commission rejected Fish, Wildlife and Parks initial plan, uh, the commission put forward public scoping on the Madison River. When we filed our petition in 2019 and again in 2020, uh, the commission said we need more time, we need more time. And then in 2020, following the, the, the end of the NRC, put all the Madison um, issues out to public scoping. We've scoped the Madison more than any other thing, I think, in Montana. Um, and then last year in April 2021, you um, you delayed implementation of the cap for a year till 2023, and then uh, adopted the work group. Uh, we provided unanimous recommendations, taking all of these in consideration, and urge you to put that out to rulemaking. 
thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, hi, Brian McKeon again. Um, I would strongly consider you to support um, the first motion to put out the recommendations to public comment. Uh, there's an advantage of that. It, essentially, scoping your recommendation is a very uh, narrow scoping on these recommendations. We will get identical public comment through either process. Um, as uh, Dr. Bias mentioned, um, we have copious amounts of public record from multiple scoping sessions and public comment rounds in the past. So we can look back to those to see all the many different ideas that have been provided in public comment. We have looked at those as members of this work group. The advantages of putting out the public comment now, the community is well aware of all the issues. The community is ready for this. The guiding and outfitting community knows that this is coming. There's nothing new here. Uh, 28 days is more than enough time to collect uh, specific comment on these recommendations. Um, furthermore, you have six months, um, so uh, you can adopt um, if, if the arm is refined uh, in January. Um, I, I see no advantage to another round of scoping when we may um, be able to progress things now. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, Commissioners. My name is David Poole. I'm here on behalf of Montana Independent Living Project and all people with disabilities. Um, my concern is, or I definitely understand the hard work that was put in by the work group and all the data that's been collected and um, would like to <clears throat> thank everybody involved. And also my concern is uh, the not nonprofit organizations that are out there that provide access to this river for people with disabilities and including veterans and improve qualities of life. Um, the way it's written um, feels like with the amount of time that a guide has to provide for his family and to uh, make money and his opportunities, if he donates a trip after three trips, all the rest of them are taken against him to make any money towards that. And I just feel that that's a concern for us and limiting the amount of time that we have on the river or the amount of trips that we're able to take with guides that we have. Thank you. Thank you. Is there further comments? Again, Dan Larson uh, from the Madison River Work Group. Um, just wanted to express uh, First, the appreciation for uh, that you've expressed for the work that's gone into this. I also wish to express um, our appreciation for you guys all, all sort of just absorbing all of this in a very short period of time. There's a lot of information there. And prior to going out, if you decide to go scoping session, if it would be productive to have a, uh, a work working session with the commission, staff, and the work group so that you can gain a greater appreciation of the details, the options, alternatives that went into our proposal here. Um, and maybe that helps you just absorb it and be ready for um, productive next steps. Thank you. Morning, Commission members. Uh, my name is Mac Menard, M-I-N-A-R-D. I'm the Executive Director of the Montana Outfitters and Guides Association. I was a member of the um, Madison River Work Group and was detailed to the commercial side of it. My seat on that committee um, was identified as someone who has uh, expertise and uh, history in uh, fisheries management. Um, with that said, um, our charge was to um, come up with an allocative plan in that commercial group that focused on um, a cap and historic allocated use. And we did it. Um, we did it in spades. Um, what we have done collectively is provide you a mechanism that will work 
with those two caveats. With that said, it is a monumental piece of policy to be implementing. You are going to monetize days, trips on a river for the purpose of guiding, and it is a huge piece of policy change in that regard. The transferability part is incredibly important. The elements that are in this plan will work if that's the direction you need to go. From my point of view, I don't have problem with hearing from the public directly about this plan and, and, and its larger policy implications. I'd like to know that. Um, but I do know that people work very, very hard, very diligently, and in a, a collaborative manner, mostly. <laughs> but um, it, was a, it was a good effort. And um, uh, I just want to let you know that if you go to a scoped effort on this aspect of the plan, I, I, don't, I don't see the problem per personally. This I'm speaking for myself um, with doing that. Um, when you compare it to the other timelines we're looking at, I don't want to see us get into a box where we've gone out for 28 days, we've had substantive comment, there's going to have to be changes, and then we sit around till January, have to make another rule, and then we have to go out to public comment again. I could see that pattern developing here. So good work and um, good luck. Thank you. Further commenters? Commissioners, my name is Allison Trelor. I'm a member of the working group. I'm gonna take a little bit different twist. I appreciate the efforts that have gone into this and the information that gets put at you last minute. One of my biggest soapboxes, which Commissioner Byroth is familiar with in um, historical meetings and letters that I've written to the commissioners is looking at the total re river recreation. This is the first time as a group, we've been able to bring a package to the table that addresses commercial and non-commercial and being able to move forward with that. While I feel the urgency of just wanting it not to go to scoping, I think we've met a momentum to recognize regulating a non-commercial sector that needs to be done right. And if you do not look at both uses on the river, then we should not have a river recreation plan at all because you cannot regulate one group without regulating the other to make an effective river use plan that works for everybody and the biological health of the river. So I will close with that comment. And thanks for your time and recognizing the efforts that we as a group put together. It, like you said, with spades at some times, but we have agreed it's more important to move this forward than for our personal agenda. So thanks for your time. Thank you. It's, it's great to see the group. Um, when we put the group together, it was bios and names on pieces of paper. So it's uh, great to have you guys here in person. Are there further comments? Do we have any commenters online? Madam Chair, there are no hands raised. Okay. All right, any further comments or questions before we go to a vote? And we will be voting on Commissioner Byor's motion first. Okay, all those in favor of Commissioner Byer's motion signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Aye. 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 Uh, motion fails. So we will now vote on Commissioner Byors. Um, oh, Commissioner Tabor, sorry. <laughs> Commissioner Tabor's motion. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Aye. 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 Okay. All right. Motion carries. All right. I I do just want to again thank you guys because the thing is we would have nothing to go out to public comment without the hard work that you guys put into this package. And so I look forward to uh, the next steps and, and I just wanna thank you guys again and um, we appreciate everything that you've done. Madam Chair, a couple of comments here. In the scoping process, you know, I, I'd like the, the department to be very clear and comprehensive about what we're scoping because we don't honor these folks and their hard work unless we do it right. So some of the concerns that Commissioner Byorth had expressed and others that somehow or another something's going to get lost, 
please do not let that happen. Um, it's also really important to point out some of the other things because there's a pretty heavy emphasis on the commercial limitation, but the real intense work that was done outside of that, like we just heard, that that is the bigger, broader issues that we need, you know, and having just lived through the last two years of, of limited entry systems up in Glacier and watching how that's profoundly impacting the area and all that, but that's that's effectively a model that we're going towards. And that's why it's so important to get the entire public involvement on that, because is it necessary? Sounds like it is. Are we all prepared for this in the state of Montana? Not so sure. So that's why we have to really do a good, robust. So um, I, I, for one, will throw my hat in the ring to help make sure that that scoping document is as inclusive and comprehensive as possible. Commissioner Siebel, one more comment and we're moving on. Just wanted to, Madam Chair, I, I wanted to be the first to uh, to propose that we take up Mr. Larson's suggestion of having a, a detailed working sure. session regarding sure. the the details went into the process. So I appreciate that offer. Yeah, I, pre yeah, I do appreciate that also. Yeah. Go. Uh, I have a couple questions. Okay. Uh, there's there's some amb ambiguities in that proposed rule that we didn't talk about, and and that is what constitutes a comprehensive. Uh, let me look at my notes to make sure I say it right, that it would be implemented on adoption of a comprehensive package. What does that look like is one. And the second ambiguity is I heard a commitment to keep moving forward, but I didn't hear any particular time or dates. Is that something you could suggest right now and commit to a, a timeline so we know that we're not just kicking it under the rug again? Madam Chair, Commissioner Byers. Yeah, that, um, <clears throat> the commitment would be to start working on it right away, continue pushing it, have the working group together as we talked about for a work session with the commission uh, and look at this and, and get this detailed out because the way I look at this, even going out for an arm rule, it isn't ready for an arm rule. We'd have to make some assumptions in here to put that out under recommendations. So we want to get that all together and then put it up for public for the scoping part of that. And as we've heard, we want to also get, it's, it's from my perspective, it's heavily focused on the commercial we want to hear the non-commercial part of this as well. So does that answer your question, sir? Timeline. Is oh. what... ASAP. I mean, start on it right away. So we're going to have them, have, let me go put this together and something we can get a scoping document and um, put it out there. And <clears throat> all right, I'd like to quit for time, for time frame. Chair Robinson, Director Worsick. Yeah, so assembling it at ASAP, putting a work session on the calendar, um, making sure that the document that goes out to initiate scoping um, is clear and comprehensive. That's the start piece. I understood Commissioner Byer to also talking about the ending piece. Um, that there is no, there is no, uh, there, there is no hard line on this long or this long or this long for a scoping session. We have heard the commission talk about more. This is a big deal. Make sure we have enough time uh, to gather good comment. We've also seen the commission move today, at least, on uh, 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 revisiting the current, the, the existing definition of implementation for the cap. That also speaks as staff. We hear that speaking to a tolerance for a good long scoping window. Um, I don't know if that would be a 30-day window or a 45-day window, but something more than the 21 days um, that are currently described if it were to move forward with scoping, uh, with rule, rulemaking right now. Chair. Go ahead. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Commissioner Byer, if the, if the commission were to indicate when they would like the department to have that scoping completed and ready for the commission's review, we will adjust to whatever timeline the commission decides. Uh, Madam Chair, so uh, I guess the question is to do this right, how much time does the department need? Because part, part of my frustration with that one arm rule is we kept chasing a deadline with a gun to our head and, and it doesn't leave for proper process. I want this done right, not fast. And, and I know that everybody else would like to get it done tomorrow or yesterday, but what can you realistically commit to to have a, a, a really robust scenario that we can roll out? Um, Madam Chair, Vice Chair Tabor, I think that, um, you know, to Quentin's points about the, the tolerance for a robust scoping window, certainly um, considerably more than the 28 days that would be allowed under the Secretary of State's process, I would say that, you know, to do this well, 
um, I think we could have uh, this scoping process complete and a good work product to you um, by your December meeting. Madam Chair. All right, Commissioner Walsh. Final comment. I just want to thank again the five members of the work group who came today and particularly those who gave comments and um, and also say that I, you have a personal commitment from me not to lose the momentum that we created um, in the work group. And I really am so proud of the work that everyone has done and the uh, unanimous support that we had for these proposals. I guess, Zach, um, the, the second part to the question, it, the motion, is it clear enough as to when we would move forward with the, the cap? Madam Chair, members of the commission, um, I'm going to have to go back and <laughs> look at that motion again if, if, to be specific. I mean, I think it said, uh, I mean, you you are proposing that uh, today as an amendment to the existing rule. So that puts us into the Secretary of State's right. timeline. So, right. Yeah, today's, today's motion, I think, covers um, that. It's an official proposal. And it, it's now in the Secretary of State's timeline. And so that would be published, I believe, July 8th. And I think his... If I'm correct, I think his question is uh, the wording of it is that clear as to what would uh, constitute moving forward with that cap. Um, uh, just for everybody's information, let me read it again. So it so it reads to amend section 1211 6705 subsection three to be implemented upon the adoption of an allocation method or a comprehensive river plan and rule package. Madam Chair, members of the commission, I, I think that's that's uh, that's clear. I mean, okay. we'll, in part because there will be a check-in by the department to follow up when those two items have been completed. Uh, at that point, it would be in your um, in your position to uh, take final action if you okay. choose. All right. Thank you. And we're going to move on to the next item. Uh, Dr. Rice, please. Chair Robinson, members of the commission, um, I think it is still morning. Um, so good morning. Um, for the record, Eileen Rice, um, that's spelled R-Y-C-E, Fisheries Division Administrator. Um, the first item I have for you is um, the drought update that we do at all of the, the meetings during the, the drought season. Um, the good news is there's a lot more water out there. Um, it's, it's difficult when we see such devastation from the water, but certainly fisheries people are, are happy to see that the drought conditions have improved. There are still some parts of the state that we are concerned about for drought conditions, as was mentioned during the commission updates, along the High Line, um, along the front, particularly in the east, is still suffering from low water conditions. There are some uh, waters we're watching closely for potential restrictions, including um, the Sun, the Smith, um, and others. The conditions on the Smith have improved, but um, they are still not where uh, they should be ideally for this time of year. And right now we have no restrictions that are imminent. And of course we'll be in touch if that changes. I did also want to mention Fort Peck, even although flows have come up in the Missouri in general, the water's still not reaching Fort Peck. Fort Peck is still very low with limited boat access. And additionally, the Mussel Shell River is also very low. So with that, um, and, I, and I please encourage all the commissioners to reach out to myself or any of the staff if you've got any questions on the water conditions or um, potential restrictions. So with that, our first item is an endorsement on amending the angling restriction and fishing closure rules 
These are the rules that are implemented for what we commonly refer to as the hoot owl restrictions and fish enclosures related to drought conditions. They're intended to minimize fisheries impacts during times of high temperature, low flows and or both. During the last couple of years of drought, we have had several discussions with the angling public um, outfitters, guides, and other organizations on how these rules can be improved. If these rules are endorsed during the public comment period, myself and staff are committed to closely working with these organizations and others to vet the rule language to ensure we have something that, that's workable for everybody. The proposed changes in the rules would incorporate specific criteria for cutthroat trout and would provide additional guidance for when a restriction or closure will be implemented or lifted. In a typical or average year, these restrictions may be used on only one or two waters. However, during extreme drought conditions, such as last year, these rules are used far more extensively with 33 restrictions and closures going into place during 2021. Commissioner Byworth mentioned during his opening remarks, the standing hoot owl regulation on the lower Madison. That's uh, not part of this rule. It's an actual fishing regulation that the commission put into place. Um, I've had conversations with Commissioner Bioworth and others on this. Um, currently, Fisheries is working on the fish regulation package that will come to you at the October meeting, um, which will go out publicly in August. Um, our hope here is um, with these potential new rules going into place, there'll be less need for that standing hoot owl restriction on the lower Madison. So it's likely that you will see a proposal from the department um, to lift that standing hoot owl restriction from the lower Madison when we bring our rules package to you later in the year. Um, so with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Commissioner Walsh. Uh, Dr. Rice, uh what I hear in the community is um, if we can do anything to uh, get the word out earlier, so maybe a you know 72 hour advance notice on these closures when we have them. I suspect uh, Mr. Bias will have comment on this. Um, and and the other thing that I perceive as being pretty cumbersome is when the department's trying to reach me for approval on closures, and I don't you know. I've never declined one. I, I just wonder if you, you should revisit that as part of this uh, review of the arms. Chair Robinson, Commissioner Walsh, um, those, uh, certainly the first one is one we've struggled with is the notice for the public. Um, we do try to get notice out of what we're seeing coming as, as far ahead as we can. And we'll try to do a better job on that. One thing that we started to implement last year that helped us a lot is rather than doing um, individual restrictions or closures as they come up, is doing, well, last year it was weekly. So on a Monday morning, I would have a drought meeting statewide with all of the regions so as we had an idea of what was coming up at that time. And then that's when we would start to reach out to the commission. Um, what we can do, and hopefully it's not as big of an issue this year, but what we can do is start to go to the public when we get those updates on Monday in terms of this is what we see as potentially coming this week. Um, although I would caution 72 hours in the world of changing conditions with temperatures and water flows, 72 hours can be a long period of time but we can certainly commit to giving weekly updates on what it is we see coming. 
As for the notification um, of the commissioners, so as the rule stands right now, um, we need the commissioner for that region to approve the closure. If that commissioner is not available, we go to the chair. Um, and that seemed to work well from our standpoint last year. Um, I know there was an, a week early in June where we put 12 restrictions on in the one day, and we were able to get all of those signed by the director and the commissioners notified at the same time. Um, I'd, I'd be open for suggestions on how else we can do it, but last year was an unprecedented year with numbers of restrictions and closures. Um, and, you know, we had the system down fairly well. But again, I'm happy to take any suggestions. Commissioner Walsh. Just to follow up on that one, I, I, I know in my case, I'd be fine with just, pardon me, a notification of what we're doing. I, you know, I do try to look at weather forecast when I get called on those and, and see what's going to come in the next few days. But, um, and I think erring on the side of, conservatism when it comes to um, warm water and trout is probably my preferred approach. So I, I, I think you might make a few mistakes by going out 72 hours early, but you can certainly look at weather forecasts and, and predict rather than waiting for three consecutive days of 73 degree water. And my, my only other comment was uh, why restrict this just to cutthroat trout on the 68 degree move and um, urge you to consider other uh, subspecies of trout. Chair Robinson, Commissioner Walsh, um, on that last point, so we do have non-native salmonids in there, which covers rainbow trout, brown trout, brook trout, and the cutthroat designation of 66 would cover both West Slopes and Yellowstones, Bull trout have their own separate designation. Um, if there's a particular species you're concerned that we're not covering, I'm I'm not sure what we're missing. No, I'm, <laughs> so we're, have we moved into the the actual next item on this discussion? Or no, the, okay, okay. Chair Robinson, this is part of the rule we're talking about. Okay. Sorry. No, I may have misread it. I thought we were talking about uh, 66 degrees for cutthroat only. So if it covers all uh, all the salmonids, I'm fine with that. Yeah. Commissioner Byerth. Thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, Dr. Rice, I'm a little concerned that 66 degrees is actually uh, fairly square in the, in the range of, of salmonid tolerance. And we will reach that, at least in the Yellowstone River, we'll reach 66 degrees fairly early in the year as soon as snow melts over with. So I'm a little concerned that it's so, uh, I like the idea of the conservative approach and protecting the fisheries. I'm a little concerned though, that that might be, uh, it might take away a lot of opportunity in, in uh, very popular rivers. Chair Robinson, Commissioner Byworth, that's a good point. And I didn't expand on the additional information that will be in the statewide fisheries management plan. Um, this rule is ahead of you before that management plan gets finalized. The, the concept here is for not all waters with cut through to fall under that 66 designation. A river like the Yellowstone, is likely in the management plan to be listed as a, as a primary non-native salmonid river. So it would fall under the 73 designation. Where that 66 degrees came from was work that was done in the Bitterroot. Um, what Pat Saffel and his biologist found there was if you went any higher than 66, even to 67, you had reached a mortality level for the West Slope cutthroat trout. So we're looking at that 66 cutthroat designation for those primary waters that are designated cutthroat waters. So it's not necessarily waters where there's cutthroat, if that makes sense. And those waters would all be clearly 
defined within the management plan, which of course will have its own public comment period and will be in front of you for more comments. So right now we're not defining where which waters fall under those categories. That will happen within the management plan. Commissioner Walsh. If I may, I move the Fish and Wildlife Commission initiate rulemaking to amend 12.5.507, 12.5.508 arms. Is there a second? Okay, thank you, Commissioner Tabor. Any questions or comments? Okay, is there anyone present who would like to speak to that? Commissioners, thank you. Again, my name is Mike Bias, Executive Director, Fishing Outfitters Association of Montana. Um, we support the amendment of these angling restrictions and fishing closure administrative rules. Um, with, I, I think this is um, an introduction of, of uh, changing rules with new procedures from the department because there are several things um, that have yet to be discussed. For example, Commissioner Byers brought up the 66 degrees and, and that is gonna be applied to cutthroat conservation waters, but um, we, we um, foam and fish, wildlife and parks hasn't, uh, we haven't talked to fish, wildlife and parks yet about where those locations are, which rivers they are, uh, you know, which FAS and above um, gets implemented with these triggers. Uh, the other thing that uh, we plan on discussing with Fish, Wildlife, and Parks further is um, the uh, removal criteria of, of, of the hoot owl restrictions. So at, at what temperatures and durations are these restrictions taken off? And, and those will be in discussions um, with Fish, Wildlife, and Parks in the future once, once this um, um, is passed or potentially passed. Um, the other, I had a question on um, procedure, Dr. Rice, Commissioner um, and, and Chair Robinson on, on the, um, the standing hoot owl on the Madison River. Uh, that it, it's implemented in July 15th and extends until August 15th. Um, there's talk with the department and, and other groups about um, with these new rule amendments, that rule uh, or that regulation, it's a fishing regulation, is not going to be required in the future because of, of new removals and, and um, triggers. And, and we as FOAM, we're going to propose uh, removing that fishing regulation at this time, given um, the flooding on the Yellowstone River and, and issues involved with outfitters over there, um, closing a 25 mile stretch this year that seemingly shouldn't hit any hoot owl triggers um, is, is punitive. Um, and there's really no reason um, for that if, if it allows access from other rivers and anglers to continue to fish there. Um, the challenge was- Your time is up, so you need to um, uh, wrap it up. Please. Well, the challenge is, can you as a commission remove that regulation during this meeting for this year um, with the understanding that we're, uh, the department was thinking about removing it anyway? Okay, that, that I, I will have um, Dr. Rice thank um, you. speak to that. Thank you. I don't think we can do action on anything that's not on our agenda though. Um, is that correct? Madam Chair, members of the commission, that is correct. Okay. Dr. Rice, is, would it take um, the commission action to lift that, I guess is the question. Uh, Chair Robinson, uh, members of the commission, that's, that's my understanding is it is a regulation. It's, it's not part of the rule um, and it would take commission action to change. Um, I would ask legal counsel about the procedure as to when that would or could happen. Um, 
certainly from the standpoint of fisheries um, with the water conditions, it it makes sense to to lift it. We can still put a hood owl restriction in place on that part of the river if the criteria are met, but conditions are looking pretty good right now. Okay, thank you. Madam Chair. Commissioner, Commissioner Tabor. Um, I don't know if this is a question for Zach or someone in the department, Dr. Rice, is there is there any emergency provision that, that would give the authority to the department to be able to exercise discretionary options in situations like that. Cause I know the whole community worked pretty hard to get the Yellowstone open in the first place. You know, you worked very hard and so did others. And so these are really, if I understand what Mr. Uh, Dr. Bias was saying, this is a mitigating measure partly because of what's happened to the river so far. And so it's, it, it feels to me like an emergency provision. Do we have anything that gives us, or gives the department even more specifically the authority to, to, to do that one time only? Madam Chair, Vice Chair Tabor, our emergency rulemaking authority is, is fairly confined to those circumstances, like you saw last week where there was a, a threat to you know, public health and safety. As far as what other options there might be, we would have to evaluate that and, and see where there might be or if there was an option for us to do something like that. I think uh, in any event, you know, it, because it is a regulation that he's referring to, that's probably um, gonna have to come back to, to the commission at some point to be dealt with. Okay, any other questions? Okay, is there anyone else present who would like to speak? Madam Chair, Commissioners, I'm David Brooks with Montana Trout Unlimited. Our organization and members do support this proposal going forward as proposed, especially with the clarification by Commissioner Byorth and Dr. Rice's clarification also that this is more of a tool as a scalpel rather than a sledgehammer and that the details of exactly where it makes sense to add additional conservation measures for cutthroat trout um, without har undue harm to opportunity for most of the year makes sense. Um, so we do support that and look forward to being part of the process when it comes to that statewide management plan and, and deciding where cutthroat streams are, as do our members. I also would add that I think this is a great example and um, of shared sacrifice that the conservation community and that anglers and angling businesses bring to the table when there are drought conditions and at times that other water users like agriculture and ranchers and municipalities are being asked to make sacrifices. And this shows that we who care about the resource for the fish and um, are also willing to make sacrifices. So appreciate those considerations and, and you all thinking about moving this forward. Thanks. Thank you. Are there any other commenters present? Do we have any commenters online? Madam Chair, there are no hands raised. Okay, thank you. All right, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. All right, we'll move to the next one, thank you. Our final item is a regulation change to remove all bag limits on Rainbow Lake in region one. Um, a fish removal project is scheduled on Rainbow Lake to begin sometime early fall. This temporary lifting of all bag limits will allow the public an opportunity for increased harvest prior to the lake being depopulated. The purpose of the removal project, which was approved by the commission in December of 2021, is to remove non-native salmonids and replace with native West Slope cutthroat trout. During the public comment period, seven comments were received, two in favor and five outside the scope of the proposal. Um, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Commissioner Tabor. Uh, Madam Chair, I move that the Fish and Wildlife Commission remove the bag limits on Rainbow Lake located in the 10 Lake Scenic area of Lincoln County, effective immediately through August 15th of 2022. 
Is there a second? I'll second that. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Lane. Madam Chairman, so this comes out of my region, and I know the hard work that the fisheries people have been up here. This is pretty standard for us to go ahead and try to get as much through opportunity before we go in and you know effectively annihilate a population and then repopulate it. So it only stands to reason to create a kind of a neat opportunity for anglers up until the point where we start doing remediation. So I uh, hope that everybody supports it. All right, is, is there anyone present who would like to comment? Is there anyone online who would like to comment? No, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. All right, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carried. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rice. Madam Chair, um, could I ask that the department through the fisheries maybe examine the concept of giving some type of emergency authority in situations where we have significant floods, you know, drought, whatever else, um, it would be nice to be able to address an issue like, you know, Dr. Bias brought up. I don't, I don't know what that looks like, but I just like some thought put into it by the department, maybe come back in a dialogue and then we can decide whether that makes sense to move that towards some kind of rulemaking. Go ahead. Chair Robinson, members of the commission, just as a historical perspective, when we've had these situations in the past, um, but and I'm talking for the fisheries issues, whether, um, you know, for various reasons, when we've had to change a regulation quickly, um, what we have done is pulled together special commission meetings um, held them over the phone, still noticed them publicly, and then, you know, basically held a meeting that's still available to the public and took care of the issue that way. So I, I put that out as an option, knowing that July 15th, when the hood owl would go into place, is, is right around the corner. So, Okay, thank you. Mr. McDonald, if you want to move on to uh, mountain lion quotas, please. Oh, oh God, what did I call? Oh my gosh, Mr. Wakeling, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I was reading, I was reading yeah. off of my script rather than looking at you. <laughs> well, good morning, uh, Madam Chair, uh, members of the commission, uh, Director Warsak. Uh, my name is Brian Wakeling, I'm the game chief, and I'll be presenting the uh, mountain lion quotas this morning. Um, the uh, department um, has taken into account uh, the changes that the commission has adopted as part of the season structures. And our overall intent in the uh, approach that we took to uh, setting the, uh, the or recommending the quotas this year is largely to try to, to maintain the harvest that we've had um, in recent history. Um, there is an exception to that, of course. Uh, we've also, as part of our, our quota development session, we, uh, we had a uh, Lion um, Ecological Population Objective Committee that uh, was established for the Northwest Eco Region. Uh, that includes all of Region 1 and part of Region 2. Um, that committee uh, worked together uh, through facilitated sessions. Uh, the report that they finally prepared uh, with the assistance of the department um, uh, is part of the, uh, the public record that we've, we've shared as our support, support material. Um, that group uh, largely recommended that we try to manage uh, lion populations in the Northwest Eco region to try to uh, obtain a 12 to 13% population reduction over the next five to six years. And so based on our efforts uh, through modeling and the population estimation procedures that we've used, uh, we formulated recommendations to try to achieve that, uh, that objective. And so it's not a, a 12 to 13% increase in quota. What it's trying to do is increase the quota, increase the harvest so that it'll achieve that objective over that five to six year lifespan. Um, other parts of the state, we've tried to keep the targeted harvest largely uh, the same as what it has been. But if you look at our historical harvest in some of those areas, um, you know, the uh, Rocky Mountain Front, for instance, parts of Region 2, 
um, you know, even uh, some units in Region 3, uh, because of the nature of the hunt and the nature of the access in those areas, sometimes our harvest historically, it looks like we're recommending a much higher increase in our harvest, but that's kind of been our target all along. And so what, we've, what we're actually recommending is what our recommendation has been for a number of years. Um, with, in just some of those places, it's just extremely difficult to attain the harvest that uh, the department might wanna see. Um, but the department uh, uh, did have uh, one amendment uh, that we sought to, we, in the process of uh, uh, making this recommendation, um, it was in uh, Lion Management Unit 339, and we have asked uh, Commissioner Byarth to carry that amendment for us. Um, there also is another amendment that addresses uh, three of the uh, units within Region 5, and the department's evaluated those and doesn't believe that there's going to be any biological effect um, associated with the amendment that's been proposed. And, uh, and that's my, my brief overview. If there's any specific questions, I'd sure be glad to try to address them. Madam Chair. Mr. Tabor, go ahead. Uh, Mr. Wakeling, so um, the first group was targeted for Region 1 and they did their work. Um, could you just re refresh our memories? Now I believe that the next targeted region is 2. Uh, and then you're going to go through a sequence. Could you just kind of let us know how that's going to transpire? Madam Chair, Commissioner Tabor, um, yes, the, the second one um, kind of moves into the uh, uh, it's a, and it's a two-year process where we're, we basically take the time to do uh, some of the spatially explicit capture, recapture, you know, try to get a really good estimate on the, the number of, of lions that are occupy a particular area. And so, yes, um, our next uh, uh, ecoregion is kind of moving into that southeastern por portion of the state, not all of the southeastern portion. And then we have the third section will kind of be the uh, kind of the, the central, uh, south central part of the state. Um, when we get to the western or the eastern part of the state, um, the, the lions there are at very low uh, population levels. And so we do not have an intent at this point in time to go through a similar effort uh, for the eastern portion. Um, but once we complete the, the south central, then we'll move back to the northwest and, or I'm, Yes, the Northwest, and uh, we'll test that again and, and see whether or not our recommendations and the commission's actions have been able to attain the objectives that we the commission has set forth. Follow up, Madam Chair. Go ahead. So do you anticipate, Mr. Wakeling, that that eco regions two and are the, the second and third iterations, will that be their work be done by the time we consider this same topic? this time next year, June of 23? Uh, Commissioner, uh, Madam Chair, Commissioner Tabor, uh, likely to be two years from now. Um, each, of those, each of those, in order to collect the data, um, we would, uh, would um, take one year to collect in a, uh, in a primary sampling area, and then we follow up with a secondary sampling area. That allows us to get the estimate of the population. And then we use that to, um, we provide that information to the group and that group would then uh, provide their recommendation through kind of a, it's a structured decision-making process that the team works through. And, um, and so that whole process takes about two years. So it would be about two years from now. Thank you, Madam Chair. Final uh, follow-up and then, so the only reason I asked a lot of comments that I got on this is we're willing to go with this status quo in hopes that we get the feedback from the committee, much like region one did so that, because there are still a lot of concerns out there by the folks that are, uh, you know, looking at our ungulate populations, sheep in particular, and wondering, are we doing enough? I mean, I think I received as many comments on that as anything. And I know that the committee will be the one informed. So if I understand it correctly, it sounds like that cent South central region will come later, but the next one, which is the southwestern portion, will that be done in time for this decision-making process, which is effectively region two by this time next year? 
Um, Madam Chair, Commissioner Tabor, I'm sorry if uh, was unclear. Each one of those eco regions takes two years. So that Southwest eco region will be two years from now. We'll have the data from that. And it would be four years from now for the South Central. Um, you know, the commission certainly has the prerogative to uh, change any of the quotas during that period of time. And um, based on the, you know, we'll, we'll take that information and try and, you know, if there's compelling reasons to change things, that's not going to limit our ability to, to, uh, to, it may not be the optimum situation from a scientific standpoint to look at inferences uh, based on what the, what the committee ultimately may be telling us. Um, and so our, our, our preference is largely to try to look at this and from a stable standpoint, but if the commission chooses to uh, sees a need to change quotas in the interim, that's certainly something that uh, we can factor in. Commissioner Siebel. Madam Chair, Mr. Wakeling, just to follow up to Commissioner Tabor's question, would Region 5 be included in the South Central survey or at least the areas around the Beartooths? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not sure I followed the question. Uh, with, with regards to eco regions and the studies, two more years for Southwest, two more years on top of that for South Central. My question is, is Region 5, particularly like uh, LMU 5, I think it's 525, are those in South, or would they be included in the South Central assessment? Um, uh, Madam Chair, Commissioner Siebel, I think from my understanding, um, uh, Region 5 is, is mostly in that eastern part. I'm looking at Molly, our carnivore. And she's nodding her head. So it's mostly in the eastern part and that because of the, uh, the low density of lions within that area. Um, the, and when I say low density, I'm certain that you're going to point to a place and say, well, this ain't lion low density right here. There's certainly places and portions of that that are higher density. But overall, uh, most of that habitat um, does have lower lion density and it makes it uh, makes this it's not an effective way for this technique to work. Any other questions? Madam Chair, um, knowing that there'll be some amendments to it, I will just make the core motion and then let the other commissioners amend. But I move the Fish and Wildlife Commission adopt the 22 proposed special mountain lion licenses and quotas presented by the department in the attached master list with all the other quotas and licenses of the 21 season unchanged and less addressed by this proposal. Okay, thank you, Dr. Commissioner Lane for the second. Okay, are there any questions or amendments? Uh, Madam Chair, uh, I'd like to move that the 2022 mountain lion season quota master list proposed by the department be amended to increase the lion quota from six to eight mountain lions in lion management unit 339. Three three nine is that what you said? Okay. Yes. Thank you. So is it I second? Amend my like so, okay, this is the first time we're using this new. But we, I would treat Zach. I think I have this is a question for you. Would I treat these amendments as motions? So I need a second to the amendments. Okay. Is there a second? Okay, Commissioner Lane. Thank you. Okay. So, so as a matter of follow-up, are these friendly amendments to my core motion or are, they, are we putting three motions on the table? My intent was to make it a friendly motion with your lead. A friendly amendment to the motion, to the original motion? Right. Okay. All right. So I accept, I accept that amendment. and. Okay. Commissioner Lane, do you accept that? Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Commissioner Siebel. Madam Chair, I, I'd like to make a friendly amendment to... Uh, Commissioner Tabor's motion, I, and I move that the 2022 mountain lion season quota master list proposed by the department be amended to increase the overall quota from 24 to 25 in lion management unit 502, increase the number of special limited licenses from one to two, and the male sub quota from five to six in lion management unit 525, and include one special limited mountain lion license in addition to the quota of five mountain lions in lion management unit 580. I accept that amendment. Commissioner Lane, okay. So since this is a new process for us to be, are you guys bringing this in? Are you, can you email that? If it does pass, can you email it to the, or do they already have it? Okay. Oh yes, okay, perfect, okay. 
All right, are there any other amendments? Okay. Any other questions or comments before we go out for public comment? Okay. Is there anyone present who would like to comment on the um, mountain lion quotas? Madam Chairman, uh, members of the commission, Mac Menard, executive director of the Montana Outfitters and Guides Association. Um, uh, we fully endorse the uh, motion on the table with the uh, amendments. Congratulate the commission on a bunch of hard work on structure and now bringing in uh, uh, the harvest side of it. And um, particularly on the amended amendments that came forward, I think it's proof positive that the public process works because those were a product of, um, of comments that came in from the field. And so uh, with that, Madam Chairman, I'll close and uh, ask you to move this one forward. Okay, thank you. Any, any further comments? Madam Chair, Commissioners, I'm Casey York out of Hamilton with Trap Free Montana. Um, I think it's really important when you're looking at quotas, approximately 80 mountain lions were reported as incidental trapping captures in the past four years. These cats never come off your quotas, but yet they're dead. Not all of them, but a good portion of them are. And I, I really think it's a disservice not to be calculating them into your numbers. Thank you. Thank you. Any further comments? Do we have any commenters online? Yes, Madam Chair, we have Allison. Okay. Um, so, yep, go ahead, you're mute, unmuted now. Hi, I'm Dr. Allison Dahlman. Aldo Leopold, member of the American Society of Mammologists wrote, lethal control of large carnivores was driven by politics rather than science. The ASM made science-based challenges to lethal control of naval manos, particularly large carnivores by the federal government in its excessive direct effects on targeted and non-targeted species. Given grizzlies and wolves were extirpated from the Western contiguous states by the 1930s, their concerns were valid. The consensus is depleted and destabilized populations of large predators harms biodiversity and ecosystem resilience, but you commissioners have the ability to learn from previous mistakes. Significantly decreased habitat and populations exacerbated by local predator removal causes concern about non-target mortality, effects on biodiversity and ecosystem by disrupting top-down forcing. Poaching and roadkill, which can't be quantified, intensify the need to lower quotas. Scientists state that non-lethal control should replace lethal because of reduced ecosystem resilience, bycatch from non-selectives, traps and snares, population reduction of certain species valued by the vast majority for a few interest groups, and lethals ignore the economic benefits of wildlife watchers. Non-lethals are less expensive and more effective. Studies demonstrate that stable, naturally regulated populations of carnivores not exploited by humans reduce livestock predation and restore the functional role of apex predators, such as cougars, to ecosystems. Wildlife agencies need mortality data on all sources, so harvest quotas don't push totals beyond sustainable levels to be in line with the best current ecological, social, and economic data. Park County receives over 36 million from out-of-staters like us coming to view wildlife, money creating over 3,000 jobs and contributes to state and local taxes. Wildlife viewing is second only to scenery. However, the scenery is dependent on healthy populations of keystone species, including cougars and wolves. To maintain it or Yellowstone's ecosystem will fail again. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Are there any further commenters? Madam Chair, there are no other hands raised. Okay. All right. So any other comments before we go for a vote? All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. Motion carried. Thank you. All right. Next item. Thank you. <laughs> Um, the next topic that I have uh, to pre present on is a uh, proposal to continue uh, translocations of 
captive uh, raised um, trumpeter swans within the uh, middle Madison Valley. Um, this is a um, reintroduction effort uh, using uh, genetically um, appropriate uh, animals to be released within the Madison Valley. Um, overall, um, um, yeah, I just want to make sure there's a quorum to talk to. Um, so uh, um, overall, this is a uh, uh, genetically appropriate release. Um, this is a, a release that has been ongoing. It usually routinely takes about five years to get these populations established from these releases. Um, the challenge that we have is that the source population um, is has limited uh, production and there's uh, they're competing with some other places uh, to, to place them as well. Um, what we're looking at is releasing approximately five cygnets, which is a, a young swan, um, about uh, once every year for uh, through through 2026. Um, should uh, HPAI, the highly pathogenic avian influenza, become an issue? It's something that we will be testing for. Something we'll be looking for. If it becomes an issue, the uh, the releases will be foregone. Um, there was an environmental assessment completed on this project, and uh, um, it's it's a uh, um, there was no significant impact uh, detected. You know, we're looking at five. Uh, one of the concerns that was brought up through that process, however, was uh, are these animals going to be susceptible to harvest? And based on the radio telemetry uh, animals that we've released at this site uh, within Montana, the only place that that's likely to occur is within Freeze Out Lake. And these birds don't don't go there. We haven't haven't detected them in that area. We haven't seen anything in the past, and so we see that as being a, a relatively low concern. Um, certainly possible if they move into some other states, such as Nevada or Utah to the south. But again, this hasn't been something that we've seen uh, historically, and both of those states uh, have very tight limits on the number of trumpeters that can be harvested. Um, be glad to try to address any question the commission might have. Any questions? Okay. Would you like to make a motion? Yeah, okay. Madam Chair. Um, I move the Fish and Wildlife Commission authorize the release of trumpeter swans annually during the 2022 through 2026 seasons within the Madison Valley is proposed by the department. Okay, thank you. Any questions before I go up for comments? Okay. Is there anyone present who would like to comment on this? Do we have anyone online who would like to comment? No, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. We do have a quorum. So all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. Motion carried. <laughs> all right. Um, okay. Thank you. Chair Robinson, members of the commission. My name is Mimi Wallach, W-O-L-O-K. I am a land agent with the Land and Water Unit of Fish, Wildlife and Parks. I'd like to present today a proposed fee title addition to Mount Hagen Wildlife Management Area in Region 3. The Willow Creek property is located approximately three to four miles south southeast of Anaconda in Deer Lodge County. It consists of 829 acres of native grassland, shrubland, conifer forest, and riparian habitat. The property shares two and a half miles of boundary with Mount Hagen uh, Wildlife Management Area and shares an eastern boundary with a conservation easement held by Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. Acquisition of this property would extend the ecological benefits and habitat effectiveness of Mount Hagen wildlife management area, and access to land already managed by fishery, for fisheries, wildlife, and recreational opportunities. 
The property provides mule deer and elk winter range and pronghorn fawning and spring range, as well as ri riparian habitat for species like moose and ruffed grouse. It contains one mile of Willow Creek, where recent genetics data has confirmed the presence of pure strain West Slope cutthroat trout and a potential bull trout reintroduction site. The property is bordered to the north by a subdivision and further subdivision north to the northeast and the east of this property is possible. The property was appraised at $2.59 million without structures. The department would pay this appraised value from the following sources. Almost $2 million or 75% of the purchase price would come from federal Pittman Robertson funds. Approximately $258,400 would come from a combination of Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation and the Montana Fish and Wildlife Conservation Trust. The remainder, or about $389,000 would come from Habitat Montana. Currently, this property contains structures and the landowners would donate these structures to Fish, Wildlife and Parks. In compliance with the Montana Environmental Policy Act, uh, Fish, Wildlife and Parks completed an environmental assessment for the proposed project. Two alternatives were analyzed. Either the agency purchases this 829 acre parcel in fee title, or it does not purchase it. The environmental assessment was released to the public for comment for 30 days ending March 1st, 2022. The public was notified of the proposed action through various means, including an open house held in Butte on February 8th, two legal notices published each in Butte, Anaconda, and Helena newspapers, a news release, a notice sent to neighboring landowners, Deer, County, Deer Lodge County officials, local conservation groups, and other interested parties, including over 250 parties on the Butte Area Wildlife Biologist Distribution List. And a public notice was posted on the agency's web page with the draft environmental assessment available and an opportunity to submit comments online. 36 parties submitted comments on the proposal. 33 were in full support, two provided conditional support, and one was opposed. A decision notice was released on March 8th that recommended proceeding with the acquisition. Based on the ecological and recreational benefits of this parcel and on public support, I would recommend the department approve the fee simple purchase of the Willow Creek addition to Mount Hagen Wildlife Management Area, including the purchase price. I would like to thank the landowners, Gail and Roger Burnett, for their extraordinary patience during this process. And I would like to thank Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation and the Montana Fish and Wildlife Conservation Trust for their generous donations. And finally, a thank you to Mike Mueller with RMEF, who has gone to great lengths to ensure this process stays on track. Thank you. Are there any questions? Commissioner Siebel? Madam Chair, I'd like to make a motion. Go ahead. I move the Fish and Wildlife Commission approve FWP's purchase of the Willow Creek addition to the Mount Hagen Wildlife Management Area. Is there a second? Okay. Any questions or comments? Madam Chair, just real quickly, I wanted to echo the thanks from the commission to the landowners, all the funding partners, and to the staff for this great, uh, great piece of work. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so is there anyone present who would like to speak to this? Madam Chair, Commissioners, Director, my name is Mike Mueller. I'm the Senior Lands Program Manager for the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. And um, thank you for the motion. And uh, obviously here to just add to the great report Mimi gave uh, and our support for this, for this project. Um, I wanna thank uh, Region 3 staff, Marina and Warren's here, uh, Mimi and Bill and Vanna Bacadori, all the hard work that went into this. 
And I also want to just mention the landowners. Um, we have a history with these landowners, Gail and Roger Burnett. It goes back six or seven years. They're very, very conservation minded. They have a vision like the rest of us. This property could be sold privately, subdivided, who knows? They've already had a lot of interest in it. But I know uh, Gail and Roger because they sold some other property to us about six years ago. And we saw it was called the Zeke's Meadows project and it went into public ownership with the Forest Service. So they're very conservation minded. This is a very generous offer of them. We've been, like I said, working on this for over two years and location is everything here. You know, it's, I, I will tell you this, uh, there's been a lot of history in that area because of all the public lands. Going back in 2002, the um, watershed project was 32,000 acres. That project ended up to be Forest Service land in the Garrity WMA. You might know a lot, not know a lot of that history. We also did a couple other additions to Mount Hagen WMA uh, just a couple of years ago. And then uh, we also bought another section from a willing landowner that added to Garrity. So there's just been a lot of uh, activity there and it's been really exciting. That by the way, has been our pattern and our partnership with the state of Montana is buying lands that are threatened next to our great wildlife management areas. And you can see the location of this one. Can you imagine um, a subdivision of 30 acre lots or whatever in between a WMA and a conservation easement that you guys hold, that the state holds. So really, really critical uh, location there. So just a couple big benefits. Um, well, lots of great benefits to the both the fisheries and the wildlife habitat. And it is a public access project. We looked at 3,200 acres of additional improved public access. I need to say too, that this is a bargain sale that these landowners are bringing to us. Properties valued at over 3 million, they're bargain selling it to the Elk Foundation at 2.59 and we're passing that on. So, so many incredible, great, uh, generous uh, thoughts here and we expect really broad public support. So thank you and we, uh, we'd appreciate your support to get this done. Thank, thank you. you. Madam Chair, members of the commission, again, for the record, Marcus Strange representing the Montana Wildlife Federation. Y'all look hungry, so I'm gonna keep this short. This is an amazing project. We're very excited to add uh, onto Mount Hagen. I've got many phone calls already from folks in the Anaconda community wanting us to speak up in support of this project. So there's already that broad support that uh, Mr. Mueller mentioned. Um, I will uh, publicly thank the Elk Foundation, the department, and the landowner for this project. It's a, a true collaborative process that's bringing this forward and we're excited about that. Um, this is good for everybody. It's good for the landowner, it's good for wildlife, it's good for the fisheries. And uh, finally, I will say that I was asked by the Anaconda Sportsman's Club who couldn't uh, be here today to express their support as well as Montana Trout Unlimited wanted their support uh, heard as well. So a uh, lot of support coming in for this and we look forward to pushing across the finish line. Thank you. Thank you. Any other commenters? Is there anyone online who would like to comment? No, Madam Chair. Okay. All right. All those in favor of the motion, signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. All right. For uh, what we have left on the agenda are public comment on items not on the agenda. Um, I would like to start, uh, where did he go, Mr. Mueller? Oh yeah, there you are. I can't see behind that podium, I'm sorry. Thank you again um, for your support. And we look forward to finishing that project and take it in, onto the state land board and getting this finished and celebrating that, that another great accomplishment. So I love what I'm doing right now. Again, I'm Mike Mueller with the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. We have an amazing partnership with the Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks. We really value that partnership and what you all do for the resources, the staff, everybody we get to work with. And you may not know of, or have heard of these statistics, but we're 38 years old, homegrown, started by four Montanans in um, 1984. I was hired in 1989, so I've seen the amazing partnership over the years. We've done 326 projects with Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks, impacting 313 acres, 313,000 acres, conserved and protected over nearly 60,000 acres, opened up to public access 81,000 acres at a value of about 61 million. 
that is a great partnership and we want to celebrate that. And so many times we get an opportunity. So you heard about all the activity over by Anaconda, Mount Hagen, Garrity Wildlife Management Area. We realize it takes a lot of um, hard work, uh, dedication and time from the staff. So we have what we call a pretty prestigious award that we would like to present to the Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks. And this one is to the region. And we've got Warren Hansen, the new wildlife manager here. If I could ask him to approach, would that be okay, Madam Chair? Yes, that would be fine. Thank you. So on behalf of the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, uh, this is a Elk, Elk Country Partnership Award to the Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks Region 3 in appreciation for your significant contributions to the Mount Hagen and Grassy Mountain additions, uh, significantly expanding the Mount Hagen Wildlife Management Area. So thank you, Warren. We look forward to working with you. And finally, we do recognize the real estate staff and the local field biologists that really make this happen on the ground. And I get to work with them, so I love to award this. Um, Martin Balukas got an award already, but he couldn't be here. He was a real estate uh, staffer like um, Mimi is. But also we've got an award for Vanna Bacadori, the field biologist that writes the EAs, works with the landowner, does all the wonderful jobs on the front line with the resources and with the landowner. So this is for Vanna Bacadori. Could we give her uh, some applause too? She might be watching. All right, thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, anyone else um, like to speak on any items that are not on the agenda? Madam Chair, Commissioners, Director Warshak, my name is Mark Cook. I'm a veteran. I'm retired from the Sheriff's Department in Missoula. And I have just a couple comments. I've been following the Elk Advisory Group very closely. And I hear all the time, stakeholders, all stakeholders. It doesn't represent all stakeholders. But I'd like to leave this on a good note. Ian Wargo, who is on that commission or on that group has reached out to us and he's about killing wolves. He's about killing lions. He's about hunting, ethical hunting. And he is a star on that group. We go back and forth. We agree on very little, but he's positive and he's willing to listen to all stakeholders, which I find the department is not doing. Second, concerning the annual wolf report. You're going to release the proposal for next season tomorrow. It would sure help us, the people that like to rely on science-based management, if we had this wolf proposal too. I've seen it released as early as February, and this seems unusually long. And what bothers me a little bit about this is the department has a proposal they're moving forward with that's gonna be released tomorrow, but you don't even have the information for the annual wolf report out to the public. So I can only wonder the decisions that are, made in, are being made to kill wolves in this next hunting season, snaring season, and trapping season. Is it based on science? Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Do you have a timeline for the wolf report to be? Chair Robinson and Director uh, Morsick. Yeah, so we have we have settled to generally speaking midsummer for release for the annual report. I mean, you heard here uh, an evolution over time on that timeline. One of the biggest pieces that's driving that release date is the IPOM, our, our population estimate that uh, one of the inputs to that process is uh, comes out of our telephone harvest surveys. So we have to wait for our telephone harvest surveys to, to conclude. That conclusion date has moved later with the insertion of shoulder seasons that run until February 15th. So we don't start calling elk hunters until February 16th. So um, not as an excuse, just as an explanation for that timeline. To be very sure, we've confirmed and we've confirmed again that the uh, annual report that will include the population estimate 
will be visible to the public and to the commission as decision makers prior to the final on August 25th. Chair Robinson. Thank you. Any other comments? Madam Chairman, members of the commission, Mac Menard with the Montana Outfitters and Guides Association. I just wanted to make a very quick update relative to your recreation industries and the flooding. Um, we have uh, maybe a little known fact, probably 30% of the revenue stream that comes to the outfitting and guiding communities outside of the hunting and fishing. Um, licensed outfitter in the state of Montana provides hunting and fishing services, but 30% of our revenue stream through that is outside of that. So the river rafting side of things, the flooding events, very, very germane to it. And I want to celebrate the, the work that uh, Director Warshick did with um, his staff, the, the speed with which you've responded to uh, the destruction and damage, and then the announcement for a reopening. There's hundreds of thousands of tourism dollars at stake here. I've, told, I've spoken to several uh, operators who've reached out to us and um, they're refunding hundreds of thousands of dollars. And so the gateway communities need all the help they can get. The speed with which you operated was uh, outstanding. Thank you. And I wanted to pass on to you that we're working um, as a direct point with the federal partners as well. And we're optimistic that we're gonna be seeing um, uh, temporary use days on forest service and BLM uh, properties that will allow uh, temporary one time, one season only uh, transfer to other areas. So Stillwater, um, Yellowstone, the Swan, these are all, all areas that we're actively engaged in. And I'll close with this. I was delighted to work with Senator Daines and Senator Tester's staff to get a joint letter from both of them to the federal agencies, encouraging them to move with the speed with which Director Worsick did. So thank you very much. Thank you. Any further comments? Do we have anyone online who would like to comment? Yes, Madam Chair. First, we have Ilona. Okay. Just a reminder, it's a two minute time limit for items not on the agenda. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you. I'm commenting on the upcoming wolf hunt proposals. My name's Ilona. I'm a resident of Gardner. My living depends on both wildlife tourism, Montana's second largest industry, and on my being able to observe and write about wild wolves. I support restoring quotas of one wolf each to wolf management units 313 and 316. Wolves in Western Montana and especially the Gardner area are essential for our economy. Gardner's economy faces collapse after the recent national flooding disaster, but the damage began when this commission removed wolf quotas in 313 and 316. Millions of dollars are at stake with wolf tourism. $82 million come into the GYO, GYE just from wolf tourism. Each year, Yellowstone loses 2 to 3% of park-based wolves to hunters. This year, it was 19% killed in hunts at the park boundaries, mostly in Montana. Elk decline is used as the excuse by the commissioners and legislators for increasing the take on wolves. Yet, elk populations in the state uh, exceed FWP's goals in every region almost, and there are 473 elk above population objectives in 313, and Montana has 50,000 elk above the state objectives. Wolf Management Unit 316 has no wintering elk. Wolves kill on average about 60 out of 2,500,000 cattle per year in Montana. Killing wolves does not increase elk or save cattle. Please protect Yellowstone Wolf Project research, which shows how well wolves manage and balance with elk and other discoveries, and which is the basis for North American wolf management. The governor and his appointees claim that you support Montana businesses and oppose big government. Imposing an extermination order on wolves, a species valued for their role in our ecosystem, their role in our tourism economy, and for cutting edge wolf research. Your that, time is up. Thank you. That for feels hands. like big government to me. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, next we have Allison. Okay, go ahead. Get star six to unmute. There we go. Go ahead. 
Thank you, Dr. Allison Dahlman. Visitation specifically due to wolves contributes at least $82 million in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Montana's tourism industry depends on non-residents. In 2019, non-resident tourists spent by region over 140 million Missouri River, over 492 million Southeast, over 297 million Central, over a million in Glacier, over 378 million in the Southwest, and over a billion in Yellowstone. Clearly, Montana would benefit from restoring quotas of one wolf in Montana wolf management units 313 and 316 adjacent to Yellowstone Park's northern boundary. Visitor activities by percentage, day hike 42, wildlife watching 34, nature photography 31, all non-consumptive and wildlife watching is growing rapidly. Last year, my husband and I visited Montana just to see our wolves leaving $8,000 there. But with your wolf killing legislation, traps and tr snares littering the state, blatant disregard for wildlife, our dogs and humans, why risk getting hurt or contributing to the economy of a state determined to eliminate the species we come to see and whose vast positive influence on other species and the environment is undeniable. Montana is absolutely discouraging visitors with all your wolf and wildlife killing legislation. 80% of US scientists disapprove of Idaho and Montana management plans and state they pose a threat to the wolf populations in the Western United States. The fact that neither state has accurate or reliable wolf population estimates is reason enough to at minimum reduce quotas or using best science, stop hunts until accurate data is assimilated. Destabilized wolf populations will accelerate ecosystem decline as well as the economy. We witnessed Yellowstone's decline once. Do we really need to make the same mistake by removing wolves again? We know how trophic cascades work when humans don't interfere. Let the wolves perform their jobs so Montana's ecosystem and economy can thrive. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have further commenters? Madam Chair, next we have Helena. Okay, go ahead. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and Commission members. Thank you for your work and the opportunity to speak today. My name is Helena. I am the Science and Technology Director with Wolves of the Rockies. I'm also a taxpaying property owner, living year round in Gardner, and a member of the Bear Creek Council in Gardner. And we recommend the Commission return quotas to one wolf in each wolf management units 313 and 316 around Yellowstone National Park and in state quotas of one wolf in unit 110 around Glacier National Park. These are public lands and biological laboratories. Wolves may disperse between viable islands of habitat and failure to protect and maintain connectivity corridors by allowing wolves to be killed en route or as they temporarily step over national park borders where they may spend 95% or more of their lives could be interpreted as a failure to comply with the connectivity of populations mandated in the U.S. Fish, Fish and Wildlife Final Rule when the state of Montana gained management over the species. Current regulations damage decades of world-renowned groundbreaking research, affects my way of life here in Montana, and endangers the economy of our community and our livelihoods. Wolves on the landscape are essential for Gardner, Silvergate, and surrounding areas, including Bozeman. Damage to this economy began with the removal of quotas and now is exponential due to the recent flooding. Tourism is Montana's second largest industry. The 2022 economic study, Tourism in the Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem, compiled data showing that wolves, wolf watching alone brings in over $82 million to our economies here in the Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem. Yet wolf regulations have allowed killing more wolves in Region 3 than in all of Montana. Finally, we ask you to oppose trapping, snares, baiting, and night hunting, all of which are counter to fair chase and a tenant of North American wildlife management. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, next we have Deborah Slicer. Okay, go ahead. Um, star six to unmute. Okay, go ahead. I've unmuted, can you hear me? Okay, thank you. I'm Deborah. I live in Region 2. Thank you, commissioners, for this opportunity. I'm here to do some special pleading on behalf of the Yellowstone wolf population. Uh, I'd like to see the commission return to 2021 quotas in units 313, 316 around the park. That would be one wolf per unit. I know some people say there's no such thing as a Yellowstone wolf, a population deserving of a special treatment, but I respectfully disagree. I think there are such creatures. Uh, first of all, a Yellowstone wolf dens, hunts, rendezvous, raises their family in the park. 
96% of the time. Those wolves are used to seeing human beings and scopes and they're less wary than non-park wolves and they're more vulnerable to hunting. So geographically and behavior wise, there is such a thing as a Yellowstone wolf. A Yellowstone wolf is the subject of a of decades long uh, international project, science project that uh, can't sustain losses like the losses of 21, 22. Uh, a Yellowstone wolf has uh, a huge economic value to gateway communities, including, and especially Gardner just now. Those people are here, I'm sure to uh, speak. So I'll say no more about that. Uh, the non-consumptive public, the non-lethal public consider Yellowstone the primo place to uh, view wolves. If uh, a visitor goes to the park and wants to see a wolf, they are going to see a Yellowstone wolf unless those wolves become too wary of human beings and hide. And there are some guides who currently worry that that's already happening. The Yellowstone population is not a threat to the area elk population. They're over objective and they have stellar records uh, as, in terms of livestock predation uh, per Board the Montana Department of Agriculture and APHIS. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, next we have Michael Dahlman. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair and commissioners. Uh, my name is Mike. I'm a resident of Madison, Wisconsin, and also a member of the Bear Creek Council, and just a regular guy. So if I'm a little nervous, please forgive me. Uh, I would like to echo the sentiments of others who have encouraged you to uh, reinstate one wolf quota in wolf management units 313 and 316. There's folks a lot smarter than I am who can talk about the health of the elk population and livestock depredation and fair chase ethics. What I'd like to tell you about is a day I had in October of 2019. It was the heart of the pandemic and my family and I were standing on a hill in the snow, in the cold. It was minus five. What you guys call autumn, geez, that's serious. Uh, we were standing behind the spotting scope watching the junction boot wolves. They were playing and howling and rallying and uh, it was one of the best days of my whole life. And we paid $8,000 to do it to Nathan Varley and his co-business owner, Linda Thurston. And we were grateful to do it. Um, they tell us that folks from Montana don't matter in this topic of wolves. But when I was with those people, I always felt like I mattered. And I'm speaking for Jeff and Taylor and Jamie and Claire and Michelle and Kara and Evan, Nathan, Linda, these are generous, hardworking, talented sons and daughters of Montana who are worthy of your consideration. Please grant this reasonable request to restore quotas in those management units. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, there are no other hands raised. Okay. Thank you, Heather, again. It was a pleasure working with you. Uh, we have no commenters left, so this is the end of our meeting. I want to thank the staff again for all the hard work that you put into this and thank the commission also and look forward to seeing everyone next time. Meeting is adjourned.